I was going to say, <laughs> just, really just so you know, Aaron, I'd rather fight than squat. Here we go. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to the April 1st regular meeting of council. And I'd firstly like to recognize that we are on the traditional territory of the Sinaimic First Nation. I believe we have some technical difficulties tonight, uh, misidentifying various members of council, but I think we all know who we are, so that's the most important thing. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. The question period sign-up sheets are on either end of the partition get wall near the gallery. If during the meeting any of you have a question relating to an agenda item, would you please write down your name and the agenda item on the list? And at the start of question period, I'll call up those who've signed up to, uh, to uh, the podium where they can address council. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items, Ms. Gurry, and we have a few tonight. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. So this evening for late items, we are adding for 10G development permit number DP1121 at 25 Spyglass Lookout, the following delegations. Number one, John Sinclair. Number two, Corrine Brolowicz. Number three, Dr. Peter Rombo. Number four, James McQuarrie. And number five, Gary Wycombe. And for um, the second late item, we are adding for agenda item 13A, Councillor Brown motion re-climate emergency. It's under notice of motions. And that's it, Your Worship. Uh, very good, thank you. A motion for approval of the agenda is amended. So Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Motion carried. You've had a chance to read the minutes. Motion for the adoption of the minutes is circulated. Councillor Bonner, seconded Councillor uh, Turley. All those in favor? Motion carried, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to give any lengthy report tonight, uh, except just to say that uh, the good people of Nanaimo still continue to write council regularly on a host of issues, often letting all council members know what's on their mind, and I encourage all of you to do so. But I, I do have to say, in fairness, that sometimes, given the volume of mail that is received, we may not be able to give you the timely response that you might like. Uh, but uh, it's a patient community, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, presentations. We are delighted tonight uh, to uh, welcome our poet laureate, uh, Tina DiBello, uh, and uh, Valenti Zanetti, Belina Zanetti, our youth poet laureate, to provide readings tonight. And Mr. Barfoot is going to introduce them, I presume. Mayor and Council, thank you for, for having us. Um, before I get to introducing our newest Youth Poet Laureate and our Poet Laureates, I'd just like to make a note that April marks our National Poetry Month in Canada, here, and Nanaimo is set to celebrate. Um, I have a list of a few events that are coming up. Um, we have some live poetry readings tonight. Um, poetry in Transit program is well underway, and we're still continuing to receive um, poems that will be placed on all the city buses in Nanaimo. We're still continuing to collect poems for a Nanaimo poetry map, which denotes locations through poetry uh, in various spots around Nanaimo. Um, April 4th, we have another poetry reading. We have on April the 18th, the Culture and Heritage Awards, where Tina Biello will be doing a poetry reading there. On April 20th, we have our Poet Laureate Reading Series in a collaboration effort with the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Um, and then we have a rainy day poetry event coming up through the library as well. So without further ado, I, I'd like to ask Valina Zanetti to come up, Nanaimo's newest Youth Poet Laureate. Welcome, Ms. Zanetti. Hi. Um, yeah, as Chris said, I'm the new Nanaimo Youth Poet Laureate. I'm really excited to start working with you guys. And I brought a poem that I wrote so I could read to you. It's called The Cardinal. Birds have wings so they could fly, and they have eyes so they can see. Have they used them to their advantage? Have they traveled around the world soaring high above the seas? Have they seen the magical forests filled with nature's beautiful souls? Have they visited famous landmarks? And if they haven't, have they that as a goal? Have they walked their little twigs across a pink sandy beach? Have they flown to heights they thought no other bird could reach? Have they ever met another along the way, one who made them never want to go away? Have they stuck around or did they just fly away? That time goes by instantly, poof, it's another day. Have they found another one closer to home? Will that love last forever? even in their catacomb. These grand adventures have they yet to be seen by the little red bird perched up high in my snowy beech tree. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zanetti, you placed me in a difficult position. I was tempted to uh, treat you as I have to treat every delegation, encouraging no one to clap or boo or make any comment on presentations in this chamber. But I, I'm sure I didn't hear any noise tonight that expressed our intense appreciation for the quality of your poetry. Congratulations. Thank you. And I guess uh, Tina Biello, Nanaimo's Poet Laureate, doesn't really need an introduction. She's been bu busy in the community helping forge collaborations and partnerships and doing some wonderful work in Nanaimo, but Tina Biello. So um, it's a pleasure to be back here. It's been, I think, a year, so I have missed the chamber. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to say that Poetry Month this year, the theme is nature. So Valina read a poem about birds, and um, I'm actually going to read, two weeks ago, a great Canadian poet and my friend and mentor died, Patrick Lane, and he is one of Canada's finest. So I encourage you all, <laughs> excuse me. Anyway, I'm going to read a couple of his short poems because he was a great nature lover and writer. It's called The Bird. The bird you captured is dead. I told you it would die, but you would not learn from my telling. You wanted to cage a bird in your hands and learn to fly. Listen again. You must not handle birds. They cannot fly through your fingers. You are not a nest, and a feather is not made of blood and bone. Only words can fly for you like birds on the wall of the sun. A bird is a poem that talks of the end of cages. And one, just really another short one from his last collection called Washita. Tradition. They named the trees without asking the trees their names. The shame of my people is without beginning, without end. I tell you, the wren cannot be taught good manners, nor the hummingbird to fly, the robin to listen to the earth. Under the bridge on the skina, baby swallows fall from their nests on ancient wings. Old boards are stacked upon old boards. There is no other way. By the glacial river, I walked in the hollow paw prints a grizzly bear left 10,000 years ago this morning. Thank you all. Good to be back. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much to both of you. I've, I've quoted this before, and that's our, our, our late, great, and much beloved Mayor Frank Ney, who said that if it came to a choice between culture and corn, and I would choose corn over culture any day. Uh, I, I think we're all very proud to say that Denaim is a city now that will choose culture and corn and whatever else it wants to, because we are a, a much more diverse and interesting community, and uh, uh, the, the talent uh, and ability that was represented here tonight is, is much appreciated, so thank you. Now, delegations, we have none. And motion for adoption of the consent items. So moved. Councillor Bonner. Uh, Subject to? Subject to, uh, I'd like to remove item D. Two, three, please, for discussion. And that's the Seniors Connect funding extension? Yes. Seconder to the motion, Councillor Thorpe. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Worship. So, um, Councillor Bonner doesn't need a, um, a motion to remove an item. It will just be considered separately after the remainder of the consent items are voted on. Okay. Thank you. So, the motion to approve the consent items with the exception of that. Councillor uh, Brown. Oh, I was just, just raising your... Oh, you th uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll call for the vote now. All those in favour, <laughs> thank you very much. The energy of this evening is always appreciated. And, and Your Worship, when uh, I, at this point, um, I would like to uh, remove myself from the council because I have a conflict with that item. So I'll let you guys Ms. Gurry. Um, Councillor Bonner, before you leave, there's one other item that was um, to be considered separately um, after the list, as besides the one that you um, had 
asked for removal and it's the um, motion from the Finance and Audit Committee meeting from March 20th. And it's just because staff wanted to include the total amount in the Nanaimo Aquatic Center score, score clock replacement. So that has been asked to be considered separately um, after the ones you have just voted on. So if you could vote on that one first and then, and then Councillor Bonner could vote. So moved. So moved, seconded, Councillor uh, Timmons. Timmons. Timmons, thank you. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carried, thank you. Now I'm out of here. Yes. So we need a motion to approve the item that has been withdrawn from the agenda. Councillor Brown, seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much. If someone can ask uh, Councillor Bonner to come back in, we can carry on. <coughs> Not even enough time to make the heart grow fonder. Reports, Ms. Gurry? Item 10A. Thank you, Worship. So this item is asking for the um, mayor and council to consent to the Regional District of Nanaimo Regional Parks and Trail Service Area Amendment Bylaw number 1231.06 for 2019. So it's based on correspondence we received from the Regional District of Nanaimo, and you'll be receiving these fairly regularly throughout your term where a bylaw um, comes here for consent from the Regional District of Nanaimo and then goes back to them for adoption if this council gives consent. So that's it, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much. Move recommendation. Moved by Councillor Hemmons, seconded Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mercer, the Parks and Trails Parcel Tax Bylaws. Thank you, Your Worship. So the regional parks and trails are managed by the RDN's Recreation and Parks Department. And one of the funding sources of this function is a parcel tax. Um, and it's requisitioned from eight electoral areas of which Nani the city of Nanaimo is one. So this parcel tax is used to fund land acquisitions and major capital development. And at their regular board meeting held on February 26, the RDN adopted a resolution to increase the parcel tax from $14 per property to 16. Uh, in order for the city to collect this money, um, we have to adopt two bylaws. And the first one is the Regional Parks and Trails Parcel Tax Bylaw. Um, and that gives the city the authority to collect the tax. And we also need to pass the Parcel Tax Roll Preparation Bylaw. And that gives the city the authority to produce um, the Parcel Tax Roll. And so both of these bylaws are before you tonight for first three readings. Uh, thank you very much, and if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Mercer, we have to do them separately, each motion, correct? Uh, so, um, uh, recommended motion number one. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, motion that Regional Parks and Trails Parcel Tax Bylaw 2019, number 7285, to provide authorization to collect a parcel tax, parcel tax, pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Brown. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Councillor Bonner. I'm Bonner. having trouble tonight. Hi there. Yeah. Thank you. Motion that uh, Regional Parks and Trails Parcel Tax Bylaw 2019 number 7285 pass second reading. Moved, seconded by Councillor Brown. Any discussion? This is second reading. All those in favor? Contrary? Motion carried. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Motion that uh, Regional Parks and Trails Parcel Tax Bylaw 2019, number 7285, pass third reading. Seconded, Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Motion that Parcel Tax Rule Preparation Bylaw 2019, number 7284, to allow preparation of the Parcel tax rule related to the regional district of Nanaimo parcel tax for regional parks and trails past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Motion carried. Motion that parcel tax rule preparation bylaw 2019, number 7284, pass second reading. Any discussion? Councillor Brown seconding. Hearing none. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you. 
And motion that parcel tax roll preparation by law 2019 number 7284 pass third reading. Seconded Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much. The next is the electric vehicle charging station grant opportunity. Mr. Sims, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, in front of Council tonight is a report for your consideration and four part recommendation. Uh, this is the city working together with the Regional District of Nanaimo to participate in the grant application led by the Community Energy Association. Uh, the part of the recommendation is to, for four stations within uh, city boundaries. And uh, the net cost we expect would be in the, the range of $24,000. The gross cost of $80,000 would need to be included in the or updated in the financial plan. But uh, once they're installed, then uh, the, the grant would come, come back to us, leaving the net of 24. Very good. Uh, Councillor Bonner. Uh, no, I, you never took. All right, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Mr. You've got the financial plan amending to 80,000. The actual cost is only going to be 24, or did I hear that wrong? Sorry, I should have clarified that. The, the anticipated range of cost per station, depending on the, the infrastructure that needs to be put in place, could be up to $20,000 each. So we've, we've created that allowance for 80,000. Once the grant is, comes through, we're expecting a $66,000 rebate, essentially, on that capital cost. Okay. Follow up if I may. Um, and are these stations going to be free or are they going to have to pay for use? My understanding is we'll, it'll be under the auspices of the regional district. Sort of we'll follow that, that pattern as, as far as I know, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Sims. Um, can you tell me how well used uh, our current charging stations are? Or, or not used? Your, Your Worship, I, I, can't, I can't tell you. I, I do know uh, some of the, the uh, stations at the parks, for example, the, or Nanaimo Aquatic Center is fairly heavily used. Um, and yeah. we'd expect we would want to put them in those touristy type areas in Nanaimo Aquatic Center, Departure Bay, that sort of location. But I don't have any data on the current usage. Okay, and may I ask another one? Thank you. Um, so if we're going to fund these to the tune of $24,000, that's for installation, using our current charging stations as a model, what kind of upkeep are we looking at, maintenance of these things? It's a very good question. Um, it's, it's a nominal amount as far as uh, replacement and, and upkeep. It's, it's just like any little, it's a dryer plug essentially with a little bit of infrastructure around it, so it, it's, it's fairly minor. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Um, when I read this over, I was kind of confused because I'm, and I maybe I am confused, um, but I remember this conversation we had at the RDN about this one, which went on for way too long, um, in which we, <laughs> which we decided at the RDN is that we would fund ten of these, ten of these stations, to the tune of forty thousand dollars, and that that was to be paid for by the RDN. That was my understanding, um, but and I, I think that what we're seeing here is four of those tens coming to Nanaimo and us being asked to pay for money that has already been allocated out of the RDN for these. So I'm kind of curious as to why that is. So Your Worship, my understanding is that the four of the ten will be covered by the city and the, the balance of six outside the city would be covered by the RDN, but that's that's, but, that's yeah, how and, I understood from staff. Yeah, and from my understanding is, but the the RDN allocated forty thousand dollars from their funds to pay for all ten. So I'm just not. I just don't understand why they're asking for twenty four thousand from us for our four, when it was already paid for. Defer. I'd like to defer the motion, please. Move to defer. Yes, for further information and clarification. Is a seconder. Sure. Councillor Bonner? Dis I don't think there's discussion. Yes, there is. Discussion? Yeah, I just, I, I'm finding this too confusing, and I agree with the points that are made by 
Councillor Bonner, so I don't know if we're being asked to pay for the same thing twice or we're asking for additional. So I would like to defer it till we can get more information. I would also like to know if, uh, it's, if they're going to be free in the city because I voted based on the rural, not based on city. So I, I'm struggling with that as well. So that's the basis for my deferral. Thank you. Councillor Brown. If Councillor Thorpe has clarification. Uh, yeah, I, I thank you, Worship. I guess I echo everybody's comments because I read this as it would be 10 plus 4 for the City of Nanaimo, so for a total of 14. Um, so I, I'm very confused if the intent was, you know, the intent that I understood from the RDN was that we would be funding 10. There was hesitation from staff to identify where those funds uh, were going to come from, um, and I believe sort of the direction was to identify the source and bring it back for future considerations. So. Um, if the intention now here is that the city of Nanaimo pay for four of the total 10, then um, I can't support that and I do think we need further information. Councillor Gesselbrock. Yeah, through the chair, just to add on that, I, I'm, I'm not clear whether it's uh, 10 plus four or uh, 10 minus four uh, for the RDN. And, and I think the taking a step back, the goal is to build a regional EV charging network um, and the RDN was the lead applicant, and now the, the, the Courtney, Comox, uh, Alberni, Clayquat, Campbell River, plus some uh, First Nations have gone on a, a shared application. And the, the location of these um, charging stations is key to have in, in key tourist areas as best as possible, and that's why neighboring municipal or municipalities have been asked to join to place these chart to be able to place charging stations in key spots in the municipality. And I think we were asked to join the grant, but uh, I'm not sure whether it's, you know, we're being asked to pay for some of the ones that the RDN asked for or uh, an additional four. Um, it'd be great if it was an additional four, because I think the more of this infrastructure, the better. And if we can get clarification on that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> I'm, I'm certainly going to support the motion to defer, although I'd like to know where and when we're deferring it to, but Councillor Armstrong can clarify that. I, I will say this, when this uh, topic came up at the regional district, <clears throat> uh, there was a great deal of discussion about uh, this amongst the directors around the table, and uh, very good discussion. Uh, I did not support it at the regional district, and I think I was a lone voice there. And my reason was that although I support electric vehicle charging stations and their expansion, uh, I felt there was too many un un sorry, unanswered questions at that point, and I still believe that. And now we have this in front of us, which to me, again, is, as others have indicated, I think is causing more confusion and more questions. So I want some more answers before I support anything else going down this road. And to Councillor Armstrong's motion, I, I don't know, is this a referral back to staff for more information? Yeah, or? I'd like to defer back to staff and I will leave it to our CAO to assign a suitable date based on staff capacity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, I know that the, the grant was due, basically this is the grant to pay for 73% of these through the province and it was due uh, the end of March. Um, so being asked after the fact it might be that we're paying for uh, four of the 10 from the RDN because we would have had to be part of the grant uh, initially. Um, so. Well, it, it seems that we're somewhat working in the dark uh, and if uh, we're not prepared to, uh, to deal with it tonight, which we're obviously not, I'm sensing the uh, motion for deferral would pass. Uh, Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Worship. I, yes, I think that you could take the vote on referring it back to staff. Um, the, referring it back to staff for more information and clarification. Um, and if, if you wanted um, a deferral date or a date that we would come back, I would suggest um, that April 29th, we could probably have some more information. But again, I would, I would wait to see what staff could come up with. But yeah, the motion to refer back to staff for further information and clarification. And I think we've heard your questions loud and clear what we need to get some clarification on this evening. So. Councillor Brown? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Just going back to the report, though, it does say that f following the meeting, city and RDN staff discussed opportunities to collaborate with this grant. 
it was determined that the best way forward would be for the city to contribute funding for four additional locations. So one, I'm sort of wondering, are we creating confusion where there is none and it would be a, additional four that are, reside within the city of Nanaimo? Um, I'll just leave that, I guess. Worship. I think council has made it clear they'd like to see an additional report clarify it and I, we, unless there's other questions we will certainly do that and I wouldn't put a date on it I'd just allow, allow us to come back when we're in a position to clarify the uh, the issues that have been raised which we hope might be sooner rather than later well if you want to put a date on it then if if it's the recommendation of the clerk no, I, I'm, I'm just I'm just suggesting strongly that rather than put a date on it but the, if it comes back sooner my sense is that council would like to be able to decide on this issue very quickly. Uh, I think there is general interest in supporting the use of electric vehicles in the community. Uh, the question is who's paying for it. So, um, unless Ms. Gurry, you're suggesting strongly we put a date on it, I think we can trust staff to get it, we'll get it back on the agenda as quickly yeah. as possible. Yes, Your Worship. So the, the motion as I have it is refer back to staff for further information and clarification. Um, so no date. Councillor Hemmons, do you wish to speak still? Thank you, yes, just briefly. I would like um, to request that the report include current usage of our EV stations because sure. in the absence of that information, we're paying for something perhaps we don't need. Councillor Gesselbrock. From the sound of the report, report, it sounds like staff have talked with each other and I trust you know, staff's understanding and decision on it. This is not a huge sum of money and it's, uh, it's something that I do believe strongly that we need. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't believe that we need to defer it. And I think, I, I, I also wanna know, is there a timeline? Is this going in with the, the grant that's being sent in or has the grant already been yes. sent in? It's already been in, okay, that doesn't matter. Seeing no further speakers, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Councillors Gesselbrock and Brown, thank you very much. Carries. Uh, emergency pump station water supply. Mr. Sims. Yes, Your Worship. Thank you. And I'll uh, apologize for the confusion on the last, uh, on the last item. Um, so the report in front of you for the emergency water pump station is that we do now have updated cost information and budgetary information for the project. Uh, with the closing of the construction tender. Um, in the discussion portion of the, the report on the second page, page 55, there's an error in the, uh, the paragraph that I apologize for again. Um, it said the current available budget is 3.0 million. That's uh, incorrect. It's 3.1 million or 3.131 as laid out in the options below option number one. So the additional uh, funding, so and the reason that, that, that uh, the budget is 3.1 is we could carried forward some of the money from, from 2018. Um, the total budget required is as located or enunciated in the report is uh, 3.886 million. And that includes not only the construction tender that you see of 3.3 approximately, which is the low bid, uh, but it also includes some additional funds for engineering, for testing, um, an overall project contingency, and uh, some payments to Nanaimo Forest Products for their electrical design and some electricity from, from Nanaimo Forest Products. So there, it's the entire um, suite. We bring the entire budget forward to you. Councillor Armstrong? Oh, thank you, Your Worship, through you to Mr. Sims. Um, you did answer part of my question. I was just concerned be with the bid at 3.3, and if we had budgeted 3.1, I didn't understand why we needed an additional 775000 So what you're basically saying is that the bid comes at 3.3, and then the additional 400000 of the, the request is for work that's either been done or concept designs that are about to be done. They're not part of the project that's in the, the tender of 3.3? Uh, your Worship, the, that's, that's partially correct, the, but in addition, I would say that the, there's, a, there's field engineering and project management costs, um, and then as, as I mentioned, an overall project contingency, we usually aim for around 10% just to carry. That doesn't mean we have to spend it, it's just there in case it's needed. 
Thank you very much for the clarification. Councillor Bonner. I'd like to move the motion that Council approve increasing the emergency pump station budget by $750,000 from 3.131086 to 3.886086 dollars with the funding coming from the Water Reserve Fund. Second. Second, Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Hemmins. Thank you. This is a, a general question for staff. We've had a number of kind of large ticket projects come back to us because the estimates that we had are actually much lower than what the market is, is doing right now. So I'm curious, do we expect that there will be a balance at some point or are we going, like, when will this even out? Um, it, it, there have just been several projects that have come forward to us with a significant increase in funds. Your Worship, that's a very good question. And, and these, these ones, we come back to with the ones that we need to add funding. We don't come back to you with the ones that we need to take funding away from. So if you, if you recall in the fall, Mr. Rosen talked about how when we estimate projects, we use average prices. So by definition, we're sort of half over and half under. Um, but I will say there's been, as you mentioned, a, a number of uh, larger ticket uh, projects that have come forward that have suffered, I should say, from not only a, a very tight market, but also the, the recent uh, tariffs that uh, have been put in place by the United States, which is sort of throwing off when we budget the, the projects, say a year ago, to when we're actually receiving the updated cost information in terms of tenders. So hopefully this, uh, this will be a diminishing occurrence. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much. The next item is item E, Age-Friendly BC Community Recognition Update. Mr. Lindsay, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, item E on your agenda this evening is an information report. Uh, in terms of background, uh, Council in the summer of uh, 2017, July 2017, as noted in the report, uh, made a motion for, for us to take steps to have the city recognized as an age-friendly uh, community. Uh, this evening, there's a, there's a delegation that's here from the Nanaimo Seniors Task Force, and they're gonna uh, walk you through the steps that have been taken since that time uh, to move us towards that designation. And that does include a plan, which they've done a considerable amount of work on and are just finalizing at this time with staff and our stakeholders, and we hope to bring forward to council uh, in the very near future. But as mentioned, this is simply for information this evening. Uh, thank you very much. I would ask the delegation to come forward and uh, remind them, of course, that uh, I, I have to be ruthless in fairness to all the other delegations that come before Council. It's five minutes. Uh, at the four-minute mark, the light will change and you'll have a minute left. Good evening. Nice to see you. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, uh, I'm well aware of the five-minute rule based on the RDN experience. Uh, uh, by the way, this is a much more welcoming uh, format than their council chambers, just so you know. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, the Nanaimo Seniors Task Force is a committee that evolved from the work on Seniors Connect project, a project focused on reducing seniors' social isolation in Nanaimo. The committee is made up of 10 older adults with diverse backgrounds and interests including teaching, healthcare, civic planning, and small business. And many of those people are behind me here today. Um, many of the members are actively involved in numerous volunteer roles in the community with many nonprofits, if I didn't already say that. The group formed in September of 2017, and they meet monthly at the Nanaimo Family Life Association. The committee has been actively involved in two events which brought seniors and people from the senior services sector together to determine what gaps and barriers existed in Nanaimo for seniors to age actively. They also used data collected from over 500 surveys to create the basis of the Nanaimo Age-Friendly City Plan. And if I can get that to work, there we are. Uh, what is the Age-Friendly City Plan? The plan has eight of the nine domains listed here and are required by the World Health Organization to have uh, this designation. Uh, to determine whether or not a city meets an age-friendly community goals. Uh, we have added a ninth domain, however, because we do it better here in Nanaimo, uh, food security and healthy eating. 
The World Health Organization regards active aging as a lifelong process shaped by several factors that alone and acting together favour health, participation, security in older adult life. Making cities age-friendly is one of the most effective policies, uh, policy approaches for responding to the demographic of aging, uh, aging communities. In an age-friendly community, policies, services and structures related to the physical and social environment are designed to support and enable people to age actively. That is, to live in security, enjoy good health and continue to participate fully in society. While the plan identifies many of the current practices which are making Nanaimo more age-friendly, uh, for example, improving and adding bus shelters, our age-friendly city plan includes 28 new objectives from the committee that, is uh, that it has identified as priorities. The Nanaimo Seniors Task Force, in participation with city staff from social planning, will be hosting a public engagement uh, event early, in early summer for the public to have the opportunity to review uh, the draft plan and provide feedback on the first five-year plan. The City of Nanaimo Managers, Regional District of Nanaimo and Island Health have had an opportunity to review the objectives and provide feedback and support for the draft plan. City Council members as well as other potential stakeholders and sponsors will receive an indiv invitation to join us at this event again in early summer. And Finally, because we're on a timeline, the, the final draft will be presented to Nanaimo City Council for adoption in, in uh, or after this public in, engagement event. And once adopted by City Council, the City of Nanaimo Social Planning Department will submit the draft plan to the World Health Organization with the goal of having Nanaimo achieve an age-friendly city designation. That's it. Well, thank you very much. You haven't even hit the four-minute mark. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and very grateful for the work that's been done by everyone involved with you, so thank you. Uh, questions? Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, not a question so much as a comment. I want to thank you for um, including food security and healthy eating. Um, I was frantically searching through my email because someone gave me a stat recently. I can't remember the exact number, but it was significant, the number of seniors that enter in, into Nanaimo Regional General Hospital who are malnourished. And there's some implications in their recovery um, when you start getting kind of three square meals a day and how that really kind of bumps you into to wellness um, alongside your recovery from whatever health issue you're facing. So I think that's just a really important element and I want to express my, uh, my gratitude. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Hammond, you speak for all of us, I gather. Councillor Bonner. Uh, I uh, actually just had a question of staff, if I may, so if you want to thank our delegation. Any questions for the delegation? Any further? No, thank you very much. Do thank appreciate you. it. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bonner, question for staff. Thank you. Um, uh, do we have a dedicated staff person for this project? Because I think its, it's importance is fairly paramount. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, John Horn, through our social planning section, has been uh, supporting has been supporting this project. Of course, Mr. Horn has recently announced he's uh, leaving the city, but we will have staff carry on and and support this important work. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Could someone make the recommended motion that report be received? Moved. Seconded. Uh, first, uh, moved by Councillor Thorpe. Seconded, Councillor Hammonds. A bit of a race here. All those in favor. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much and thank you for the delegation. The next is the Regional Context Statement Review, the Regional Growth Strategy. Mr. Lindsay, please. It's a mouthful. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this is a bit of an unusual uh, report before Council. In terms of background, um, as Council may be aware, every municipality or, or member group, including electoral areas within the regional district, must have their official community plan relate back to the to the regional uh, growth strategy. And the way they do that is with a context statement in each official community plan, which identifies how their plan then complies with the broader uh, goals of that regional growth strategy. In our case, uh, the city last amended our OCP on, on this item in 2015, and at that time we amended the growth containment boundary that's identified in the regional growth strategy to our city boundaries. 
Uh, but at that time, we should have uh, amended the actual context statement. And that's recently been pointed out to us that the context statement is now requiring upgrade update and, and needs to be amended. So we've talked to the regional staff about the approach. And given that we're going through or about to go through a, a complete review of our official community plan, uh, we don't believe it's necessary to do a housekeeping amendment at this point just for this one item. So with their support, we're recommending that we basically acknowledge that this work needs to be done, but that we'll bring that forward and roll it forward as part of our, our upcoming official community plan amendment. Review, sorry. I'll move recommendation. Mo moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Brown, that the recommended motion. Any discussion? All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next is development permit number DP1121-25 Spyglass Lookout. Mr. Lindsay, please. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I think I believe it's uh, attachment E, it appears on the, uh, on the screen behind Council. This is the air photo of the subject property. And as you mentioned, it's a development permit in order to allow for the construction of a uh, detached unit on this currently vacant vacant land. Uh, through the development permit, the applicants are uh, seeking variances, including uh, variances uh, from the natural boundary of the sea from 15 meters to 6.4 for the proposed cabin, and to reduce the setback from 15 to zero for the services uh, that will be required uh, for, for this residential use. There's also a variance that's requested to reduce the on-site parking requirement under our bylaw from two stalls uh, to zero parking spaces. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have a number of delegations uh, with respect to this issue. I would remind them all, of course, that there's a five-minute limit. At four minutes, the light will change to orange. And the first is Alfredo Tura, the owner. Mr. Tura. Well, good evening, uh, and thank you for having me here. I, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to do this uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Alfredo Tura, and I'm not a developer, not used to this kind of uh, presentations and processes. Um, and therefore, I'd like to uh, you know, thank the city and the NIMO for the support they've given so far. Um, I, uh, as a background, I am originally from Italy, and I moved to uh, Vancouver Island about 20 years ago. Uh, I apologize, I still have an accent. There is no subtitles, so uh, <laughs> I hope you can understand all the process. About a year ago, my sister, who lives in Nanaimo, uh, told me about this desirable lot and uh, that was advertised as residential. Uh, I realized that there were previous applications that were not successful, and, and, but I fell in love for the place. You will see a couple of pictures, and I plan to collaborate with the city for the development as best we could. So uh, this is the first day I walked into uh, the place and obviously uh, really loved it. And uh, this is basically the view you can have from the area where we'd like to put a small cabin and that's kind of on the top of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the property. Um, I'm going a bit fast because I, I, don't know, I know I don't have much time. And so as you can see from the satellite is a uniquely shaped kind of uh, uh, reverse C uh, that is 30 meters uh, and width at all points or at most points. And as you go closer, you can actually kind of divide it kind of topographically in uh, an island kind of the sea and then there is the connector uh, which is a neck and it's really not part of the property we discovered <laughs> because it goes underwater during high tides and then there is a small portion on on protection island so there was an R3 and to my understanding was residential when we purchased that um, that's a nice photo uh, on the lower tide it looks so much bigger but it's not um, and so that was our uh, more, you know, more specific drawing. If you can kind of see the red lines is what the property really is. So there is a C-shaped island and then there is a small portion on protection island. Um, goal of strategies. We, we really wanted to uh, really build a small seasonal cabin with minimal impact and disturbance. Um, nurture a park mentality. The place is so beautiful. We felt like protecting it, protect the ecosystem and leave it in near natural condition and contribute to the social milieu of the island, collaborate with the city, the authority, the neighbors and other parties, and follow the recommendation of the experts involved, which were many. 
some differences from previous applications, extensive professional review as required by the city, and you have the reports there, and significantly smaller building. The building went from the previous application was almost 2,000 square feet to 500 square feet. And, and also the location is slightly different. It's in a kind of a safer area still away from the Oak Meadow. And service access, you know, we basically try to make it as simple as possible, reducing the impact and basically staying away from the Oak Meadow and also doing a trench rather than a walkway, as advised by the biologists. So that was the previous application. Quick comparison, uh, you know, we provided a more advanced uh, mapping system with elevations and uh, the green square is where the smaller cabin would hopefully be and uh, the kind of black marking on the older one shows the kind of a larger envelope and also the location is closer to the edge of the rocky area. Um, this one is just to, is part of the application. You can see it, but just to give you a sense that, you know, the uh, uh, conduit will be one minute. away. Sorry, yeah. One minute. One minute. Okay, away from the uh, um, um, actual uh, um, oak metal. In in terms of collaborative approach, you have all this documentation. I don't want to go back to this. We try to connect with uh, uh, everybody we had to, and socially with the neighbors and the Protection Island Neighbor Association. I'm going to go quickly through those because I don't have time. That's where the area is. There is no trees, really. And I believe that there are benefits also to the island and the community in the sense that we would like to develop a park mentality. We would like to protect the old me oak meadow also by defining boundaries and, you know, discourage activities like fires and garbage on the island. And I believe that appropriately small impact development will define the use of this property and limit future development applications. And just the last photo with a small of a look. <laughs> I don't have great skills, but that gives you a sense. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Very, thank you very much. Questions for the delegation? Councillor Turley. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, through you to the delegation. Um, so my previous visits to protection kind of gave me the indication there aren't a lot of vehicles over there. Uh, do you plan on having a, a car of any no. sort on the island? No, no, that will be basically by boat access only. Thank you. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Um, during your consultation with partners, environmental specialists, et cetera, did, did anyone um, flag the issue of sea level rise for you? Is that a concern? Sorry, uh, issues about? Uh, sea level rise. The, the, there was some comment about that, and that's why the structure of the building would be on, uh, the idea was to make it on piles, like on uh, okay. pillows. And, uh, and there is a, uh, also consultation with a coastal engineer. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to our delegation. Have you, do, you, do we know what the, the building is going to look like? Do you have any plans yes. to show? We are, we are hoping to maintain something as similar as possible to the surrounding buildings, probably something like a log home kind of thing, like as simple as possible, and also something that will be mostly uh, low impact in terms of construction, so concrete and materials. Like That's why we're thinking about log homes, because they're easy to build. They're just piled up, so. Okay. Um, and um, do you know of any, do people land on this property at all, if, you know, people kayaking around or just stop in? Yep. Yeah, I spent about uh, almost a month on the island last summer, so we were, uh, we had, we were a little, we had a little boat at the anchor just outside of it. So uh, we spent a month, we got to know people around it, and, you know, it's pretty peaceful. It was a little bit of garbage, and I'm afraid a bit of, about fires, obviously, for, for okay. that, yeah. Thank you. Any further questions to the delegation? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next is John Sinclair, respecting this matter. It's like almost gone. Oh, no, no, you can't build on here. Mr. Sinclair. Thank you. I'm John Singler from Protection Island, and I thank you for your attention to this presentation. Fourteen years ago, I was standing in front of your predecessor, 
fighting to preserve a little jewel of the Gario ecological system. I may add, wearing the same sweater. <laughs> it was virtually the same request as has come before you, a couple of feet different in the variation being it. So tonight I hope we have the same resolution as last time. Your predecessors rejected the application eight to one. But before I continue, I'd like to say to Dr. Mr. Tura that our position should be not be interpreted as a personal attack, but in reality, it's an endeavor to preserve a local and unique ecosystem for future generations. Alfredo has been most cooperative and understanding of our position. My appreciation of Italian wine and olive oil has increased since I met him. But I'll give a brief summary of issues before other people expand on them. Some of the overarching considerations are precedence set if the variance is granted. If one looks into it, it threatens the integrity of your official city plan. I forgot my slide. Oh, it didn't forget me. Um, as we can see from the picture, it isn't a wine-shaped lot, it's an archipelago of three small islands. And the holder of the title to the property owns three separate things, uh, areas. The, the crown owns beneath the high water mark. And this isn't taken at extremely high tide. It's taken at a high tide. We, as a group, have been denied access to the environmental report. We found it hard to deal with that. And on our island, we have yet to find a proponent for the variance. But the main objective tonight and in the future is to preserve the ecosystem. And what an ecosystem. We've only 5%, we being can Canada, of the original, um, of the original area. And we're particularly well, fortunate to have this in our harbor. It's a microcosm of the Gary Oak system with virtually all elements present. In conclusion, I'd like the council to look at this and picture it with a house on the stilts to be raised above the flood level, patios, decks, wood sheds, fire pits, none of those have been included. The enormous effort of the city and the citizens would not have been necessary if one error had been rectified, correct the zoning. We must preserve this jewel of the West and not let this ecosystem be lost forever. That we thing. must minimize our yeah, generations. Mr. Mr. Sinclair, Mr. Sinclair I'm, I'm ruthless on the five minutes. Thank you. Uh, it's time for council members who have questions. Now, 
if I, if it would make a better use of your time, if you could keep your questions as this is to ha to answer at the Mr. end. Of Mr. Sinclair, I, I don't wish to appear rude or dictatorial, but the concept of the five minute rule is that everyone is treated the same way, regardless of how passionately they feel on any issue or how it may affect them. So it is time for, for questions from council members, and if they have questions, they should ask them now, please. Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, the next delegation is Corrine, uh, forgive me if I pronounce it, Brolovitz? Brolovitz. It's Brolovitz. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Your Worship and Councillors, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today about not allowing development on the lot at 25 Spyglass Lookout. The point that uh, my neighbor was speaking about was that he was asking that you ask questions if you have any after all the presenters because it's one presentation between five people. My name is Corrine Brolevich and my husband and I moved to Nanaimo in a neighborhood of Protection Island four and a half years ago. There will be four remaining residents of Production Island who would like to present today regarding the various issues related to this proposed development outlined above. We have coordinated our presentations to make the best use of Council's time. My portion of this presentation is to give an overview of Underwear Island. This name was given to this particular islet by the kids of Protection Island as it inhabits part of Long John Silver Bay, hence the reference to Long Johns. Whoops. The first time I came to Protection Island was with a lady friend who shares the same interest in ornithology. She brought me to visit one of the three little islets of 25 Spyglass Lookout to see the return of the Purple Martins in the Gary Oak Meadow. As you likely know, there is less than 5% of this natural habitat remaining. In the slide, you can see that the present distribution of Purple Martins is declining in the red. Purple Martins, which are designated as endangered under the BC Wildlife Act, rely on the biodiversity of the Gary Oak ecosystem for their food and nesting materials. There is a breeding program in place with nest boxes, like the one above in the uh, top left corner, um, built on the pilings of neighboring wharfs on either side of this property. This islet contains a rare combination of two endangered ecosystems which has helped to rebuild this colony. My husband and I are both nature advocates and we enjoy living in a place where we can appreciate the birds and other wildlife surrounding us. There is an abundance of wildlife activity on the lot in question, which we witness year round. Each season brings a variety of aquatic species as well as abundant natural vegetation. And each day with the ebb and flow of tides, we see land animals as well as aquatic species inhabit the island. There are so many other creatures inhabiting this island. There isn't enough time to display or mention them all here, nor the geology as in the sandstone formations there. We have a granddaughter who comes to the island on weekends, and she loves to come over here for the simple pleasure of unrestricted nature, exploring the tidal pools, finding baby eels, pipe fish, and other treasures of the sea. This abundance of natural wonders is why we came to live on Protection Island. Here are some of the other inhabitants of the marsh, the goslings eating the grass. In the discussion portion of the city report, and I quote, the cabin will be located within the small grassy meadow outside of the Gary Oak trees on the southernmost portion of the property. Here is the small grassy meadow on the islet in the spring covered with chocolate lilies, which only grow in a Gary Oak ecosystem. Gary Oaks are not the only part of a Gary Oak ecosystem. This is the meadow where the proposed building site is situated, which would destroy the chocolate lilies. As you can see, it's exactly where the site location is. These are the, this property is not properly represented in these plans. These pictures you were taken 59 minute. years ago. And since then, the land base has changed and eroded over time. 
We witness the seasons and changes in the tide twice a day, so we know the size and shape of this archipelago of islets. This picture was taken, I took this picture on December 20th of 2018. This is a more accurate representation of the property. The rest, what you see on the city maps is crown land. And this is for my next neighbor. Uh, do council of members have any questions for the delegation? Did you want to ask questions after when we present our, okay. We ask questions of each delegation as they speak. Councillor Turley. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, <clears throat> to, through you to the delegation, I'm wondering if um, you mentioned the chocolate lily and my background is in horticulture and I believe that's a fritillaria species which is commercially produced. It, are you referring, it looks like the flower of, of the fritillaria. Um, <clears throat> do you know it by a different uh, generic name? Sorry, uh, I'm not understanding what you're saying. The picture of, yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually, it's, it's generic name is, is a, it's a fritillaria uh, yes, and species, and, and it is commercially produced and available in garden stores for, for planting. So I'm just curious as to when you indicate that that's the only area you find it is in a Gary Oak Meadow. They're only found in a Gary Oak Meadow. Uh, well, I would have to disagree with you on that one oh. because because we used to sell them. So okay, then maybe uh, what I should say is that they are included Naturally, in perhaps. a Gary Oak. They are included yeah. in the ecosystem of a Gary Oak. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. Yeah, I Cap took these pictures, so that's in that spot. C Councillor Bonner, thank you, Worship. Um, is it common practice for residents of the island to um, go onto this lot and um, play around with it? Um, um, People go onto the island when there's low tide. That's the only way you can access it. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I got that. Um, but I, is it common for people to go on there on a regular basis from the island? People come on the weekends and in the summertime. A lot of tourists go there. They go around the shoreline. Uh, do they have the property owner's permission to do that? The property has never had um, restricted access signs on there up until recently. And since that's happened, we have not ventured onto that island. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for this delegation? Thank you very much. The thank next you. delegation is Dr. Peter Romba. Good evening. Um, good evening. My, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Peter Rombo. I'd like to thank the council and, and mayor for allowing me to speak. And if I can figure out how to get this to get to my talk. I'd like to speak uh, very briefly about the environmental uh, risks associated with this development. In particular, I'd like to talk about the foreshore, the Gary Oak ecosystem, the salt marsh, and the mud flat that surround the island. The foreshore is the circumference of the island. It links terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, and it's a highway for many species. They tend to be highly productive and an area of high biodiversity. And the importance of the foreshore is recognized in the city of Nanaimo's environmentally sensitive area guidelines. And in particular, the guidelines require what's referred to as a leave strip. And in the presentations that have been given to council, this is incorrectly referred to as a setback, but it's not. Its legal term is actually a leave strip, and as the name suggests, it's supposed to be left alone. And this leave strip represents a, a typically 15 meters in, in, your, in the city of Nanaimo's uh, guidelines, represents a compromise between the needs of developers and environmental integrity. The leaf strip on 25 Cutlass Lookout encompasses virtually all of the property. The islets, none of them are more than 30 meters wide, so that the islands as, an, as, as a whole fall entirely within this leaf strip. So any development on this island would be within what is referred to as the leaf strip, and the leaf strip, according to the City of Nanaimo's own guidelines, should be left alone. Also changing the the width of the leaf strip on this property would have a disproportionate impact compared with other properties. The developer is not act asking for 
a little variation on one corner of his lot where it may st or house where it may stick over into the leaf, leaf strip. He's basically asking for the whole island to be uh, a, a given to him uh, to, to build this and that he is having the leaf strip basically on 360 degrees. And because of the convoluted uh, nature of this particular property, it has about a 200 meter shoreline and that's equivalent to uh, changing the width of the leaf strip for about seven regular lots on Protection Island. So it's going to have a disproportionate effect. There's three very important uh, ecosystems associated with this property. One of them is the Gary Oak that people have talked about. It's uh, rest restricted to southwestern BC, primarily on Vancouver Island. Uh, it's very diverse, has many species other than the, the Gary Oak. It's highly endangered and it now represents about 5% of what the original habitat was prior to European settlement in this area. The other area that's involved is the salt marsh, which on this map is shown in, in green here. This is also a very productive area. It's a nursery for marine species. It's a very important carbon sink. It's recently been estimated that it's about, uh, it takes up as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is about as equivalent to 95 times its area if it was a forest. And it's also quite endangered. Only 33, about 33% of the salt marshes in BC have been eliminated to date. And then finally, there's this mud flat where the developer proposes to do some serious trenching, lay concrete across the, the crown foreshore uh, to the lot. And if you look at a mud flat, there's a lot more than mud in the mud flat. It's full of all kinds of tiny little organisms, some of which I've shown up there. And wherever you see these shorebirds, it shows you it's a productive area. They're there trying to find some uh, of these microorganisms to eat. So why does this matter? Well, we've got three ecosystems that are put at risk. Uh, Gary Oak and Salt Marsh are both endangered. And historically, it's often been referred to as death by a thousand cuts. One little cabin on, a, on a, a Gary Oak Meadow doesn't seem like much of an impact. I mean, who wouldn't want a, a cabin on a Gary Oak Meadow with chocolate lilies out the front looking over, over the harbor? But over the last hundred years, everybody has wanted that, and now we're down to less than 5% of this ecosystem. Allowing this proposal is just going to accentuate that, and we're essentially down to the, to the last. So what needs to be done? In my opinion, and the opinion of my, my uh, other presenters, the negative impacts of this development clearly outweigh any possible benefits. And the City Council doesn't really have to do anything other than enforce existing guidelines. You already have bylaws and laws on the book that can stop this proposal. So my suggestion is that this Council should follow its own regulations, deny this proposal. Any questions for the delegation? Councillor Armstrong? Yeah, you mentioned the salt marsh. How is this um, development going to impact the salt marsh? I don't well, see Well, the that. salt marsh comes right up to the land. So that you, you, you cannot develop on the land without having some impact on the adjacent salt marsh. The, the major impact is going to be on the Gary Oak Meadow. Uh, but because, you know, people walk on the salt marsh, uh, garbage goes into the salt marsh, there is, there's um, going to be an impact on the adjacent salt marsh and also on the mudflat. Particularly on the mudflat, you see that the, the plan is to do some major trenching and pour concrete. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, don't like to play devil's advocate here, but um, you just said the, there's a compromise with people walking on the, 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 the marsh, and, but we've been just showed pictures of people walking on the marsh all the time for the last 15 years until some signs went up recently and now nobody's walking on the marsh. Wouldn't, isn't that better? Well, I would say that it was, the, the area was never heavily used. It was, pe people have rights to the foreshore. It, it's crown land, people have the right to walk on the foreshore. Um, I would imagine that if you counted over the course of a year how many people actually walked out on that foreshore, it would be a dozen, handful. I mean, every time I've gone by it, I've seen nobody on the island. But if you have somebody living on the island and they have their property as three adjacent islets, is basically what it is, to get from, from one part of their property to the other, they're going to have to walk through that foreshore. And they're going to have to go through the salt marsh 
and, uh, and they're going to eventually uh, wear a track. And I think if you, if you look at any uh, property that's been developed, you'll see that as soon as people li live there, they have an impact. And that's why we're to the situation that we are now, that we have very little of this uh, Gary Oak Meadow left. And in fact, the city of Nanaimo has some brochures out. I'm sure on staff you could talk to some of the people in Parks and Rep. They're very, very good brochures on the, the importance of the Gary Oak and how it's endangered and what we should do about it. And I maybe encourage council to, to talk to some of the people on, in Parks and Rec on, 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 this, on this issue. I, I, it's, it's dire. I mean, it, eventually it's going to be gone. We're down to the last. It's sort of like the last one. You know, we're less than 5%. We've done that in 100 years. How many more years before there's none? Thank you. Yeah, if, if I may, and, and follow on, uh, on Councillor Bonner, uh, my impression is, and forgive me if I'm being presumptuous, my impression is from your presentation, the previous uh, delegates, uh, delegations, that uh, people have used this as essentially a local park. Um, and uh, the position and the arguments that I'm hearing from most of you appears to revolve around trying to preserve this area completely. Uh, and Councillor Bonner's point about what has been up until recently, I gather, free and ready access by anyone who is boating, who is kayaking, who is, even if they're an ambitious swimmer, can come from the harbour uh, and wander over these islets uh, without being disturbed because, of course, no one inhabits the place now. And so there is, in essence, no regulation or control over its use uh, by an owner. And I'm, 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 I'm asking you, do you not think it would be more logical if someone who actually occupied the premises uh, and obviously values its beauty, it's a unique spot, I don't disagree with you, uh, but it is a private piece of property. Wouldn't it make more sense that if someone was living on it, that would restrict the very access that you were telling us is going to damage the ecosystem? Well, I think there, there, there are two issues is that this land has already been declared as, as, as an area of a special ecological interest. And it's in the Nanaimo City Plan as, as an area that should not be developed. So the developer is in fact asking to put a development in an area that should not be developed. And in addition, once he gets his development in an area that should not be developed, he's asking for changes in the, with the, the leaves strip. So he's asking sort of double jeopardy. Am I, I think if you ask people on Protection Island what they would like, they think it probably should have been made a park from day one. That it was misleading, it should not never have been uh, listed as, as, a, as, a, as a single family dwelling. It's not connected to Protection Island, it's in fact three separate islets. Um, as my next, uh, the next speakers in our session are going to talk about, there's a whole series of issues associated with fire services and other things like that. And I, I think that maybe City Council back 15 years ago when it was brought before them for the first time should have taken the bull by the horns and rather than just say, okay, we deny it and go away, is to, to have done something about this property and to turn it into park or made it an ecologically protected zone uh, or something like that. But, you know, it, it's a jewel. And... Um, yeah, everybody loves to have their little cabin in a, in, a, in, a, in a jewel, but there are not many of them left. Thank, thank you. I, I appreciate your comments. I think we're now getting into more okay. of a presentation again. We have two other delegates uh, to speak to this. Thank you very much. The next is James McQuarrie. Your Worship, Councillors, thank you very much for the time to speak to you about this. Uh, my name is Jim McQuarrie. I uh, moved to Protection Island five years ago. As an amateur photographer, I was absolutely taken by the beauty of the place and what you can see. And how do I get there? We go. Um, but the most important elements of life here are what you can't see. The community spirit, the readiness to embrace neighbours, the countless volunteer hours that so many of my neighbours commit to their community. In this context, I'd like to talk about the many important things that I believe are missing in this report. On this map, you see a small green rectangle. 
looks very innocuous, until you realize that under the guidelines that this city has right now, there is no place on that entire property for any building to be present. Again, it's what you cannot see. For instance, every property on Protection Island has a hybrid effluent system. This includes a large septic tank and a pump tank that takes the black water into a small pipe that eventually finds its way to the city's effluent facilities. You can't see that on this map. That septic tank has to be cleaned out by a honey truck every few years, depending on how much you're using it. I can't see how that service would gain access. We have a fire truck and an ambulance on Protection Island for emergencies. I can't see how they would get access to this. Climate change doesn't just raise sea levels. It also increases fire danger, especially in forested areas that are developed. If a fire broke out in the dwelling proposed on this site, firefighters would have no way of getting to it, but the flaming cinders could easily be blown to the trees on Protection Island over the water. This photo shows the pr proposed route for services like the septic and the electricity. What you can't see is the ecosystem that inhabits those mudflats the clams and the crabs and the bugs that the birds eat. This ecosystem would be violated with the proposed trench and concrete work. Likewise, you cannot see the impact of the heavy machinery needed to build that conduit or where the building materials for the dwelling would be kept and stored. You take a walk around our island and you'll see features that turn a box on a lot into a home, things like a deck, a walkway, a shed for firewood. None of that is visible in this report all would contribute to a much larger footprint than this report suggests and a much larger impact, again, on an environmentally sensitive area that the city has already designated an environmentally sensitive area. The final thing you can't see in this report is the why. Why would the city approve this approval, approve this proposal, other, rather than the desires of the, uh, the proponent, other than for the desires of the proponent? Why allow the many proposed waivers and the potential precedents that they represent? Why resurrect an issue that Council turned down 15 years ago? And most important, why violate our city's own environmental policies and risk an environmentally sensitive area by waiving the very restrictions that are meant to protect our coastline and this rare and vulnerable Gary Oak ecosystem? Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the delegation? Thank you very much. Gary Wakem. <coughs> Mr. Wakem. My name is Gary Wakem. I'm a resident of Protection Island. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, I would just like to point out, I think as, is, as the rest of the presenters here, this is not a very pleasant experience for us to stand up here and, and criticize somebody's dream. But we're looking at this thing and saying somebody's dream has potential to be our nightmare. And this is not about us wanting a park. This is about trying to save the la one of the last pieces of fragile environment that has been untouched. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the official community plan themes, zoning and community decisions that impact this property. Um, my presenters, we, we went over this last evening because we only had the weekend to work on this and they referred to this as, as the nerdy part of the, the presentation, so I hope you don't find it too boring. Um, I don't want to stand up here and tell council how to do its job. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, I know, is very competent and he can correct me if I've got some things wrong here, but just based on us going through the city's, city's planning stuff, how it all goes together here. Um, in terms of this development application, we see there's two approvals here that are required by council. The first is a development variance permit of zoning bylaw 4500, um, which must be issued, which reduces the 15 meter leave strip to 8.6 meters to construct this dwelling. The second thing council must do is actually allow for a single residential development to be constructed within the environmentally sensitive area that's identified in the OCP. And there's the, what they call DPA2 requirements that do it. The area that's subject to the leave strip, which is the uh, a setback from the marine, or a, a, a strip alongside the marine foreshore, and the area that's subject to the 
the environmental sensitive, sensitive area cover the entire property as what is, what is shown on, on this map. Excuse me, I'm going to stay here for a minute. Um, the, the issue that we have here, that we like to start with, is staff in their presentation, in the, the report that we read over the weekend, is they keep referring to this as a variance of a setback. It is not a variance of a setback. Setback is a planning term which describes a cultural regulation. You have a front yard setback so you can have some nice uh, plants in your front yard. You have a rear yard setback so that you can have amenity space. You might have side yard setbacks so you've got fire separation between buildings. This is a leave strip, not a setback, a leave strip. And it is defined as a leave strip, distinct in the, in the zoning bylaw as being dis, is a different definition of what is there for a setback. Uh, in the official community plan, it is in the definitions and is described as a leave strip. And it is a leave strip. Um, the term is used to identify environment, environmentally sensitive lands that are to be restricted from development. So to portray this as being a setback that you're waving like you do for the corner of a building or somebody's deck, that is not the case here. I think this is a, a much more serious decision that, that is being talked about. Um, in terms of the evaluation and the recommendation that was provided by, by staff, we looked through this and we tried to find out what is the justification for allowing this development to go. And what we can't find is a reasonable argument of why you would do this. And considering in the OCP it is, de is defined as an environmentally sensitive area. Um, there's some inconsistencies here in the environmentally sensitive areas in the OCP. You cannot even cut the grass without first getting a development permit. And here we are, a house is being proposed. There's no explanation here of um, how the DFO One plays minute. into this. Uh, thank you. The DFO um, clearly explains um, that or as the OCP clearly explains that the, D, the laws of DFO must be uh, followed. And we have no, um, no recognition of that in the plan. The environmental assessment has not been made available to City Council. You as decision makers are responsible to ensure that you've reviewed all the information. You don't have it in front of you. One of the pieces of information that you don't have in front of you are the comments from the Neighbourhood Association. They raise three serious concerns. That has not been brought up in the staff report. No, am I aware that you were, you were made, made available to that? Um, the evaluation, we look at this and we see from an economic perspective, there's minor positive impact here, a cabin gets built. From a social perspective, minor positive benefit. One or two families benefit from this. Environmental, major negative impact. So we have come to the point in our conclusion that we're saying this violates the official community plan. It's not in keeping at all with the community that's described in that. And we just simply ask you the question, does this development reflect the community that you hope to achieve? Thank you, Mr. Wakeman. Any questions for the delegation? Thank you very Thank much. You. Can I move the recommendation to get it on? Yes. Councillor Hemmons has moved the recommended motion. Do we have a seconder? Seconder, Councillor Armstrong. Discussion, Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Um, this question is for staff. I'm really curious about the recommendation here. We have, um, we have a, a known environmentally sensitive ecosystem. Uh, we are, if we do this, going against our own environmental policies. And so I'm, I'm just kind of curious if, if I could hear a little bit more about why, why would we want to do this? Uh, <laughs> I, I know that, that that sounds vague, but I'm just trying to make sense of this because for me this is quite clear. Um, Your Worship, maybe I, I'll start by trying to answer that question um, with just some background about the OCP and development permit areas. And first of all, it's important to note that we have multiple development permit areas throughout the city and the purpose is not to sterilize or freeze development in those areas. As the name implies, it's how do we allow for development that is sensitive and complies with the guidelines of those areas. So uh, the development permit areas are in the OCP and then in the, the actual setbacks or the, or the leaf strips as has been discussed this evening come in our zoning bylaw. Um, so when staff receive an application, in this case an application on a private uh, fee simple piece of property, we review the guidelines of the official community plan um, in order to attempt to minimize 
the disturbance of the site. We're not going to eliminate it, but to minimize the disturbance of the site, but allow for uh, reasonable development under the existing zoning and land use rights. I have a couple more. May I? Thank you. Um, regarding the mud flat and the trench to get the utilities in and the concrete that goes, I'm not sure, back in the trench, is that visible at low tide, that concrete strip? Uh, Your Worship, I, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of the details of, of the trench or the use of concrete in there. I, I do know that the environmental consultant that was working for the applicant looked at various proposals, include, including hanging servicing off a causeway mm -hmm. uh, above grade, and at the end determined that the best approach would to be uh, to bury the services, but the details of, of how that's done, I'm, I'm not clear. Okay, and, and one more if I may, I will be quick. Um, in the report, there are um, stipulations to the building on this property, um, containment of concrete, uh, no concrete wastewater should be allowed to spill into the ground, et cetera, et cetera. How would the city monitor that? How would we ensure compliance? Um, and and that, that is worth uh, noting, Your Worship, is that the applicant in this case worked very closely with staff in our environmental section to ensure that steps were being taken uh, so that to minimize the impact of development. And the ones you've outlined in the conditions are, are some of those. And in this case, um, they would be, become conditions of the building permit, um, but it would ultimately be the responsibility of the environmental consultant to review and monitor and ensure compliance with, with the guidelines. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I will not be supporting uh, this uh, development permit application. Uh, we have development regulations in place uh, to protect uh, the ecological integrity of areas, and there is no way to build on this property without infringing on those regulations. Uh, the Gary Oak ecosystem is um, quite rare and this place has been used for a long time by folks and it's one of those cases where a special place uh, that's been used by the community and appreciated um, is privately owned and, and the signs go up and, and, and all of a sudden we do not have access to these places and I, I feel for Mr. Tura this is a very beautiful spot and I can see that genuinely I would like to protect it as it is. Um, and it's a difficult situation, but I don't see how uh, we can allow development on this place without infringing on our own regulations that we've put into place to protect the area. So um, I can't uh, support this. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I will be supporting the variance uh, based on the conditions of the permit. It, they seem to address all the concerns that were raised. It also states that the development is not where the Gary Oaks are, which I think is important. I also believe uh, Protection Island was built at the very same. So we made all those exceptions back then, and now we have one, left, one last house that if they would have came forward at the same time, there would have been no issue. So I do believe that it's all been looked after. We've got uh, qualified individuals that tell us that this can be done to preserve the environment. Uh, so I believe they've gone above and beyond, so I will support it, especially as it is privately owned. It's not a city owned, and um, the time we chose not to purchase it. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, uh, first, if I may, a question to Mr. Lindsay, which I think he has already answered, but I, I, I'm still a little bit uh, confused, and that is this term leave strip as opposed to variance. And I know mm -hmm. Councillor Hemmons, I think, asked you for an explanation, but could you, would you mind repeating it for me once again? Because I haven't heard the term leave strip before. So is it leave strip versus... Um Variance or uh, as opposed set, to a setback or variance. setback variance. Yeah, so I, I think um, maybe part of the confusion is we use them somewhat interchangeably. Um, and it, the language in general terms, the official community plan, when you'll read the development permit guidelines, talks about leave strips from water courses, including uh, the sea. The zoning bylaw includes definitions of setback. So it's, although I, I guess I would define it that a, a leave strip is a set as a subset of a setback. They're all setbacks, but leave strips are unique uh, generally to environmental areas. Thank you. So I um, I believe that Mr. Tura is a responsible uh, individual. I was impressed with his uh, presentation and he strikes me as a reasonable man. And as Councillor Armstrong just pointed out, I believe this is a privately owned lot. It is zoned for residential. Uh, Mr. Tura has the right to construct a building on it. 
Uh, but he's in a situation where it would be almost impossible to construct any building on this piece of land without uh, getting variances. Um, and on the other side of that, I totally appreciate the arguments of the delegations from uh, protection. Uh, this is an environmentally sensitive area. I, I am torn, but overall, while I sympathize with Mr. Tura, I don't believe I can uh, support the variances to allow construction in this area. Thank you. Councillor Brown. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I understand that the development, uh, uh, development permit process is a pathway to yes, and uh, I trust our staff to review the report um, to ensure that uh, you know, they are making recommendations in line with that report and they, they are following our policies in place. Um, so with that, I think, you know, uh, they're, they have done the, the work that is required of them to show that the cabin, uh, in the opinion of a qualified professional, environmentally can be cited there. However, um, the variance does fall to discretionary approval of council. Um, looking at the actuality of the lot, not just the policy, um, the variance is required. It, it seems absurd that that lot was ever created and it seems absurd that we're contemplating a, a cabin there. So I will not be in support of this application. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Now a question for staff. Um, part of the report refers to um, doing a, a study uh, on the bio uh, nature of the, of the, plant, of the island. Um, what happens in the event that rare plants are found during the survey? Your Worship, I believe you're referring to there's a statement about there'll be an inventory completed in the spring prior prior to construction. Uh, in that case, it will be first of all to identify um, the presence of rare rare plants and what other further measures could, would be taken to to mitigate impact, whether that's um, moving plants or, or relocating the siting uh, if required. But ultimately, it's still a development permit to allow for development. It's just that extra step will be taken to ensure again that that the impact is minimized uh, as much as possible. Okay. And may I may another one? Um, so, um, as it was raised earlier, um, we're just seeing the, the, the footprint of a building. Um, uh, would, uh, in the event that something came forward as from a design point of view, would it have to include any decks, patios, and what could be built on this property um, like sheds without requiring permits? Um, in those conditions that you mentioned earlier, the conditions of approval um, through worship, th those include that the development will be generally in compliance with the survey attached to the plan. So it'll basically be the footprint that you see there uh, in the attached document. So it would require further variances or amendments to the um, development permit if there was further structures required. The setback is very specific and would include all uh, structures, whether that be a deck or any other addition on the dwelling. So it would be in, within the footprint that's under discussion this evening. Okay, my, my question uh, would have been um, sheds. I know we can build a shed of a certain size without getting a permit from the city. Would they be allowed to do such that, you know, over there in the middle somewhere? Sorry, you, that is a good point. So a shed under basically it's 10 foot by 10 foot doesn't require a permit. So in that case, if it was sited and it was outside of the setbacks, the water course setbacks, if there was a place where that could be found, then yes, they could proceed. But otherwise, if it was in that 15 meter uh, setback or leaf strip, um, yeah, it would require further variance from council. Thank you. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Um, I will not be supporting the staff recommendation. Um, and I want to, like um, my fellow councillors, um, express my gratitude to Mr. Tora for um, kind of walking through the appropriate steps on this, but I do want to be clear from where I'm standing. Um, variances that we often deal with are about, you know, fence heights or a setback of a, a front yard, et cetera. These are pretty kind of typical standard things that we see. This, to me, is much different than that. This, this is a variance that is right on the ocean in a sensitive environmental area um, going uh, against our own policies. Um, so I, I can't support it. And I, I, 
I understand why you want to live there. I want to live there. It's, it's glorious. Um, but I just, I, I, can't, um, I can't reconcile uh, this in my mind. And I also want to make a point about um, an ecosystem is a system. It's a larger piece of things that we don't always see working together, but they do work together. So um, to the point regarding the Gary Oak trees, it's not just about where the tree stands, it's about where the tree stands in relation to the environment around it and how they interact. So that's my understanding of an ecosystem and um, I, I, won't, uh, I won't be supporting the staff recommendation. Councillor Shirley. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure how to uh, bring this up, but I have a thought that I believe needs to be discussed in camera, so I'm wondering if we should have a motion to defer the decision until we've had an opportunity to discuss this. Ms. Gurry, can I seek your advice on this? Um, your Worship, there is a motion um, on the floor. Um, if Councillor Turley believes there's some in-camera um, um, discussion warranted, then we could proceed in camera and then discuss first whether it does warrant an in-camera discussion, go in camera if it's decided it is necessary, and come back out into the open, or we could defer this matter until we've had the opportunity to go in camera. So a motion to defer could be made right now, um, um, and um, it would be, it would then wash out the motion that's on the floor. Then I move to defer, please. Is there a seconder? Sorry. Seconder, Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion on the motion to defer? Councillor Thorpe. Just for clarification, Your Worship, we're simply deferring until after we have an opportunity for an in-camera discussion, which would happen right now. Thank Your Worship, you. it could happen now if Council chooses, or we could go in at um, at um, nine when there was a scheduled recess and come back and report it out after or conclude the matter after. It, it's Council's pleasure. Councillor Gesselbrock. I uh, would like to go in now and hear what uh, Councillor Turley has to say. <laughs> this is a public meeting with a public application. It's important to maintain the integrity of the public process. Um, I would advise you not to do that. Any further speakers? No. Councillor Brown? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I can't support the, uh, uh, to go in camera here. Uh, this is a development variance permit. Um, all the, mat the matters uh, relevant to this application are before us. If there's additional items that are not related to the variance but are related to the property, um, you know, that can be brought up in an in-camera meeting at any time. Um, in addition, uh, no matter the vote, there is a, the, the potential to revisit any de decision of council if it's uh, re decided upon later that there was pressing in-camera information that would be relevant further to the decision. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Armstrong? Thank you. Um, As to the in-camera, I'm just wondering if we could do it in-camera at a later date, and then if um, the information that we received was significant, then there could be a motion back to reconsider the motion. Would that make the most sense? Mr. Rudolph. Um, Your Worship, I'm not sure what that the nature of the, the reason for going in camera would be, so I'm not sure what that process is. Council defeats this. If council if defeats this, I guess uh, there is a mo there is a process for reconsideration, and the clerk could possibly speak to that. Um, but again, it's just the, the maintaining the, the public decorum in the process would be, uh, you know, I'm not sure how we would characterize that. It, it would be difficult to go through a public process and then have an in-camera meeting and not share what has influenced that. So it's just a, it's kind of a conundrum, I think, in a little bit. So uh, I would just caution you on that. And I, perhaps uh, there could be some explanation as to how this could be brought back if, if it is voted on tonight one way or the other. Any further speakers on this? Question after. Anyone on the issue of deferral, the motion in front of us? 
Um, Your Worship, I just I just wanted to add that um, yes, council can go in camera um, after any time or discuss this matter at any time and and deal with the motion that's on the floor to defer. It doesn't have to be right now. Um, okay. And and determining if it's worthy of in camera is what we would do prior, like when we go in camera is that's when council would debate that. So if if I'm understanding this correctly. If we move to defer to consider, we can the in the in camera meeting will consist of firstly determining whether or not we should be going in camera to deal with that matter. If we determine that it's not, we will return and finish with the motion. Yes, yeah, council. That's the, your worship. That's the way it works. So we have item 91N when we go in camera all of the time, and that specific reason is discuss whether or not council believes this item should be discussed in camera. So until you're in there and you can discuss it, you don't know whether or not it should be in the open, but you can't have that discussion in the open. I know it sounds very confusing. I would suggest you withdraw the motion to defer, vote on the motion, and then you could deal with the matter separately. I think I have an inkling as to what the in-camera reasons might be, and I think we could deal with it separately. Uh, and to what Mr. Rudolph was saying, keeping the integrity of the, um, the motion that um, was before you and moved and seconded, I think it's best to deal with that um, in the open and subsequently we could deal with the rest. Uh, for, for what it's worth, Ms. Gurry, I'm inclined to agree with you and Ms., uh, Mr. Rudolph. This is a public process, is an application for a development permit. Uh, I think trying to deal with uh, whatever suggestions uh, Councillor Turley may have, and I think we can all speculate what they might be, but speculation is not how we can operate. I think it is more important that we complete the debate and we vote on the motion that's before council tonight. So with respect to the motion to defer, if there's no further speakers. Um, you could either um, defeat it or if the mover and seconder would agree to withdraw it, then you could go back to the original motion. Councillor Turley. Yeah, I'll withdraw as long as I have the opportunity to bring forward with my thoughts. And Councillor Armstrong agrees. So there is no motion to defer before us. It is now on the main motion, whether or not this development permit proceeds or not. Any further speakers? Councillor Armstrong. Um, question for you, the staff. So, if this gets defeated, um, is there anything stopping the um, applicant from putting up three or four big tents, and, and then they don't require yeah, any course. zoning, which would actually cause more ecological damage? So, tents, in terms of. So your worship, I just put a clarification. So the tents, you're thinking in terms of temporary summer accommodation yeah. that like somebody on his, could... on his property, he could put up three or four large tents, and is there, is is that an issue? Um, people could use their property um, for recreational, ancillary recreational use. Yes, I think that'd be pretty okay. good. Um, thank you. And uh, just one other question. So, I mean, obviously there's concerns about trespassing, because being that it is private property, he is liable. So how does he go about then um, protecting his asset, so to speak, if, if we can't do some of this stuff? Like, I mean, I think that's a legitimate concern. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure. Is that a and question or I'll a statement? Put, no, I'm just not sure. <laughs> Councillor Bonner. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Armstrong. I had my similar question. I guess I'm looking at what would happen in the event that, say, this was turned down. What, can, what things can the property owner do do on that because I, I think there's bylaws about how long you can camp out in your backyard uh, or put up a um, he could he could literally barge in a, um, um, a mobile home and park it there for the better part of four months or something like uh, is that an option is that possible your, your worship I think council is getting into an area where you're talking about a number of ancillary uses which are, are, are intended to be secondary to a primary use of a dwelling on, on a property. So I think those things would generally happen secondary or ancillary. I think I, my, my initial sense is yes, you, you could likely do some form of seasonal use of that, of that property and not be in any conflict. But in terms of what the applicant can do, um, the applicant can come forward with alternate uh, proposals for use of the land. Um, which could have different setback variances. In this case, staff have worked with them to try to identify a uh, location and opportunity that we think is the best on the property that has the, the, the smallest amount of, of impact on the overall site. Councillor 
Gesselbrock? No. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to have my say. Um, uh, I've visited that site some years ago. I'm fairly familiar with Protection Island, and I appreciate the passion and interest that uh, the delegations have brought to this issue tonight. Uh, starting with Mr. Durer, the owner, who, who wishes to proceed uh, to build a very small dwelling on a lot that was approved at some point by a previous council, uh, which by implication gives one the permission to live on it, use it, and enjoy it. And for, so for me, notwithstanding my concern about ecosystems, um, Every one of the delegates, delegations tonight uh, happily lives on Protection Island, um, survives in uh, cooperation with their neighbours to ensure that uh, appropriate care is taken to preserve the unique culture of that island and its ecosystems. Uh, but what we're being asked to do tonight here essentially, and make no mistake about it, and there is no other way around this, we're being asked to tell a private owner who purchased a lot subdivided, recognized lot, that they are not allowed to build a dwelling on it. Now, I don't want to suggest, you know, the old concept of an Englishman's home is his castle, but imagine for a moment if any members of this council had purchased a subdivided lot anywhere in this city and were told that because of the rules now imposed by a subsequent council or councils over time, that you would not be allowed to construct any dwelling whatsoever on it? I'm not going to suggest for a moment that the rights of private property should always trump public interest. But we are being asked tonight to say to an owner, because we value this property, which with great respect, all of the delegations here tonight, by implication, by virtue of the pictures they showed us, most particularly, uh, happy scenes of the meadow, use this as a public park. And I see no reason to suggest for a moment that it is anything other than that. I appreciate their great concern for the ecosystem, but this is one lot in a large province. It is not the only place where these ecosystems exist. It is not the only place where Gary Oak exists. And what we are really saying tonight, and I can't emphasize this enough, that notwithstanding, notwithstanding that this is private property, you are asking the owner to essentially leave this as a park for the use and enjoyment of others, and not just the good people of Protection Island. As I, as I indicated in my questioning of one of the delegations, anybody who has a boat, who is a strong swimmer, or who kayaks, gets to stop in and enjoy the beauty and joys of everything on that piece of property. It is obvious from the staff report that to build a tiny dwelling, which most of us would not consider living in on any permanent basis, even at the best of times, let alone for a summer holiday, in order to do that is going to have to go to incredible expense in order to enjoy what each and every one of us enjoys. I might remind the good owners of Protection Island that there were many of us in this city who found it a bit appalling that we constructed, provided water and sewer to Protection Island at no small cost to taxpayers over a long period of time, including the good people of Protection Island. We live in a community, and in this community, Mr. Tura has asked for the right to construct a dwelling on his own property. So I think it's pretty obvious how I'm going to be voting tonight, because I am not prepared to say to a single citizen, whether it be him, his wife, his family, or whoever, that you don't get to build on this property. We want it preserved as a park, but we're not prepared to pay for it and haven't paid for it. And this has been a private lot since that subdivision was developed. And if Councillor Thorpe is old enough and Councillor Tilly remind me, I think I can safely say well over 50 years ago. I'm not prepared to turn to a private owner and say, sorry, you get to provide a public park at your expense for the enjoyment of the rest of us. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> I'm, I'm tempted to say after listening to that, I'm going to change my mind, but, but I'm not. And, and with all due respect, I just want to point out that we are not, we're not telling a, a, an owner a, 
a landowner that they cannot build on their property. What we're being asked to do tonight is approve variances. And to me, those variances are significant. Uh, Watercourse setback from 15 meters to 6.4, watercourse setback from 15 meters to zero. So I sympathize with the, the owner, but I am simply not prepared to grant those variances in this situation. So for that reason, I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Councillor Hemmings. No? Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Contrary? Motion is defeated. Uh, the next is item H, Development Variance Permit Application Number DVP 380411 Dunsmuir Street. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Worship. Um, actually, if it's uh, with the pleasure of Council, I'll introduce the next two items because they are definitely related. So items H and I are both Development Variance Permit applications that are related to uh, requests to increase fence heights. Uh, just in terms of some context, uh, this 4, 411, which is the first application, uh, DVP 380 at 411 Dunsmuir, is of course the, the Service and Resource Centre, uh, City of Nanaimo property. Uh, the application, and there's actually uh, an attachment C, maybe if I could ask you attachment C be brought up. Um, just might help a little bit better explain uh, the, the request. Uh, so I present your worship uh, to the rear of the building. Uh, we have Wesley Street. Wesley Street extends uh, just beyond uh, the left side of this image and it dead ends at uh, private property, uh, which is uh, 350 Albert Street. Last year, council supported a variance request at 350 Albert to allow for a fence to be constructed along uh, that property line. In that case, it was the uh, applicant or the owners who were responding to some social disorder uh, that was occurring along Wesley Street and has continued to this day. And they were attempting to discourage uh, people uh, uh, moving through their property. So that fence was installed at the end of the street at 350. Um, on our property, uh, at, the, at the rear of the building, we have um, impacts from, from the activities in Wesley Street and specifically in the evenings after staff leave that parking lot. Uh, we have people that move into that rear parking lot and uh, underneath the overhang from our building and have resulted recently in uh, some, some damage to the building, but also some, some, some concerns for security for staff. So last year, the city completed a, what's called a SEPTED review, a crime prevention through environmental design review, and one of the recommendations of the consultant was to, to fence in our rear uh, parking lot. So this variance, if it's approved, will allow us to proceed with uh, completing the fence around our parking lot, which will include a gate uh, that will be open during the day for vehicles to uh, move in and out of, of course, and then uh, closed in the evening and, and uh, uh, maintaining that as a private space in the evening. Uh, likewise, on the next application after this, which is application I, it's for the very next property over. Uh, maybe if I can just uh, stand to jump to I, um, uh, uh, schedule D. So there's the next property and uh, schedule uh, schedule C, if I can ask for schedule C for a second. So schedule C in this this case shows the same request that's being requested for a, a height variance for a fence along the, um, the parking lot. As a result, any person coming down Wesley Street uh, would not be able to get through the city lot or through these neighboring properties, which are owned, by, if I didn't mention, are owned by the, the uh, credit union and used for their, their staff parking lot. And they would tie in directly to the previous fencing that was constructed at 350 Albert. Sorry, Your Worship, that was kind of a long introduction. I would note that the variance requests on the first application are from 1.2 to 1.8 meters for the front yard setback and 1.8 meters to 2.9 on the side yard, which on the surface sounds like a, a high variance, but uh, to clarify, there's an existing retaining wall that runs along that side of the property and the fence is being built on top of that retaining wall. So when we measure the total height, we measure from the base of the retaining wall to the top of that fence and that's why we see that number of 2.9 meters. Thank you very much. Is there anyone wishing to speak with respect to DVP 380? Oh, there is. Good evening. If you could introduce yourself and give us your address. Good evening. My name is uh, Matthew O'Donnell. I just wrote notes just because sometimes I forget my words and I can ramble a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm just um, here to talk about 
the DVP 380. Um, as a private citizen, I believe that it is truly wonderful that uh, 411 Dunsmuir Street, our city services building, has an opportunity to receive uh, variance for an overheight fence as well as a side yard uh, fence on the property. Um, I bet the fence is going to look simply beautiful. Uh, the main reason why I support an oversized fence is because it causes no real harm or danger to myself or to anyone else in the community because it's just a fence. Um, an overheight fence uh, would no doubt uh, keep our city property even safer uh, with a higher uh, fence providing an extra uh, 0.6 meters of fence height. So I must say, like, kudos if you do obviously approve the variance tonight. Um, I can't help but wonder, though, as a private citizen, if it is so easy to provide simple variance permits, uh, like here at 411 Dunsmuir Street, for just simple adjustments uh, to simple trivial matters, such as increasing an approved size for a fence, um, then why is it so difficult for other individuals uh, who might not like have city property or, or any other hypothetical situations uh, to not receive similar exceptions? Um, it, it, once again, I just want to stress to you, it truly is a great moment, in my opinion, for our city that 411 Dunsmuir Street uh, might receive a variance permit uh, tonight if uh, council approves of it. Uh, God knows that our city does need a higher fence around City Hall and our municipal government. Uh, however, another thing that our city is in great need of, especially amongst our most vulnerable men, women, and children, um, is food. Um, forget about the homeless crisis, let's just look at the overall poverty crisis here in Nanaimo, which does affect the fence, I mean, because we do need it higher to keep stragglers out. Um, oh, sorry, I lost my notes here. Dunsmuir Street. Oh, yes, 411. So I support the security fence at 411 Dunsmuir Street. Um, it really is a tremendous fence. Unfortunately, because... Um, oh, I lost the paragraph. I'm so sorry about this. I'm very embarrassed. Uh, God needs to need hard with However, another thing that our city is in great need of... Is, oh, I said that part. Um, forget about the homeless crisis. Let's just look at the overall poverty crisis here in Nanaimo, which, as we all know, uh, Nanaimo has one of the highest uh, po child poverty rates in, in British O'Donnell, Columbia. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, it's providing I'm, context to the I'm, offense. I'm a very indulgent person, but this is an application I'm almost with done. respect I'm so to variance. I'm really, I really do apologize. I lost my spot. It's the iPad. Um, I do support 411 Dunsmuir receiving a variance permit uh, tonight. Uh, for their higher security fence. Uh, however, earlier today I did speak with another private citizen who provides uh, free hot meals to Nanaimo citizens um, uh, who are working poor and also homeless, and they also support the fence. Um, I support the fence at 411 Dunsmuir Street, however, um, for this private citizen, despite providing food in a VHA approved kitchen church and doing it underneath a simple pop-up tent, uh, they're now being told by the bylaw department that their shade tent is just too high by a couple of feet. Um, only by several feet, and because it is too high, they are in contravention of another overheight bylaw. Uh, now, the fence at 411 Dunsmuir Street is very tremendous, uh, but unfortunately, uh, because of the letter from our city's bylaw services department, these private citizens are now being evicted from their home of eight years by their uh, landlord, Mr. Uh, where Mr. they have to Mr. pay their rent every time, uh, Mr. Uh, every month. Oh, sorry? I'm I only have two more paragraphs. I'm going to ask you to be relevant to the application before council. If you wish to make a political statement on another issue, on another matter, you're welcome to do so on another occasion. But tonight, you will address the matter before council, I, I, I'm speaking in support of the fence at 411 Dunsmuir. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I, what you're then, referring then, to. Then, I just have two more paragraphs. Then it's a little bit repetitious because I think we've heard I get nervous point that, that I lost my... Can I just finish the two more paragraphs? Thank Very you, sir. Good. I really appreciate it, Mayor Krogh. I really do. Uh, I support... I absolutely support the height and the majesty of our slightly oversized fence at Nanaimo City Hall and an exception must be made for this fence. However, exceptions for other urgent matters need to be given some variance or leeway as well, uh, like feeding our poverty-stricken citizens, for example, is a tremendous example of more variances our council could give to good people and properties who are providing an essential free service to our citizens, including children, and is a service that nobody else is exactly Mr. jumping up to replace, Mr. but I support Mr. the fence. Mr. O'Donnell, the repetition may be charming to you, but it's it not. is not charming I'm to so... council, and I appreciate your point. We have heard your submission. You support okay. the variance. I, I appreciate it very much. I will conclude and I apologize. I'm, it's very Christian-like to make exceptions or variances to minor bylaws for the greater good, such as overheight fences around 411 Dunsmuir Street for security purposes. Yeah, but it seems even more Christian-like uh, to not go out of your way as a city to shut down the only free hot food distribution service in the city because of a slightly higher like tent allowance. 
Exceptions can always be made. Oh no, I lost my spot. Uh, thank God for variances and thank God for exceptions. Thank God for this safe fence. And please uh, consider making other variances for, for more important issues and maybe higher priority issues that our city might encounter in the future. But uh, I love thank, that fence. It looks thank, beautiful. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Mr. O'Donnell. We thank have you your point. Much. I assume we, do we have any questions? No, I rather thought not. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, I'll move someone the make motion. the recommended motion? I'll move the recommended motion. Is there a seconder? Councillor Turley, seconded. Any discussion? <laughs> no discussion. All those in favor? I had discussion. <laughs> Sorry, you wished. <laughs> Thank you, no, Councillor Hemmins. All those in favor? Contrary? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Opposed, Councillor Brown? Uh, the next is Development Variance Permit Application Number DVP 362-424 Wesley Street. Mr. Lindsay. Um, sorry, Your Worship. Uh, I think I've covered this in the, in the introduction to the last item. Uh, same situation, same context, uh, similar variance request. Uh, the difference being instead of the uh, publicly owned property at 411, it's privately held property adjacent. Thank you very much. Is there anyone wishing to speak with respect to DVP 362? Seeing no one, would someone care to make the recommended motion? Move Council. The Second. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion? All those in favor? Contrary? Councillor Brown. Motion carried. Uh, we are now at 9 o'clock. We'll take the scheduled recess. There will be a new decorum statement read out at the start of each meeting to ensure proper decorum is taking place and to assist the chair in his duties. So the proper rules of order and the decorum will be as follows. There will be only one speaker at a time that will have the floor as directed by the chair of the meeting. There will be no interruptions or call out comments while another person has the floor. Anyone speaking out without having been acknowledged by the chair will be found out of order. If that person does not refrain from speaking without having been acknowledged by the chair, then he or she will be required to leave. For the members of the public speaking, the comments need to be respectful and constructive. Discriminatory or defamatory comments or comments that are in the nature of harassment will not be tolerated and anyone engaging in such communications will be found out of order. Some examples of behavior that won't be tolerated at a council meeting are as follows. 1. Harassment. In terms of comments about city employees, employees of the City of Nanaimo have a right not to be subjected to discriminatory or defamatory comments or personal attacks against their competency or character. All speakers must refrain from such comments about identifiable staff. Comments should be limited to issues regarding the city's policies or operations. Number 2. Section 7 of the Human Rights Code prohibits a discriminatory publication because of race, color, ancestry, place of origin, religion, marital status, family status, physical or mental disability, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or age. Discriminatory comments will not be tolerated. Number three, defamation is publication about a person that tends to hurt that person's reputation. Defamatory comments will not be tolerated. Please stick to known facts and keep the dialogue respectful and constructive.
Are you tired of dragging the garbage out? They just don't make them like they used to. It's a saying that doesn't really apply to garbage cans. Yes, young man, you seem ready for a new garbage and recycling experience. Take a look at the new green, blue, and black carts right behind you. Yes, exactly. Oh, I see your confusion. I can fix it. Go ahead, give them a try. Pretty easy to roll, right? Did you know that a set of these carts will be delivered to every house in Nanaimo as a part of the new Sort Toss Roll program? It's designed to make it easy for you to sort your waste, toss it into the correct cart, and roll it to the curb. Three carts will be assigned to your home, but the city actually owns them. This way, the city will maintain responsibility for repairing and replacing the carts when it's needed. Wow, you really are happy about this. There are a few things you need to know before you start wheeling your carts to the curb. Are you ready? Great, let's get ready to sort, toss, roll. Yeah! Did you think that this was a silent video? Well, now that you've found your voice, why don't you narrate this next bit? The new Sort Toss Roll Automated Curbside Collection Program is coming to Nanaimo in two phases. Phase 1 is being rolled out to central Nanaimo now. Sort Toss Roll will come to the rest of Nanaimo in the summer of 2018. Carts will be delivered and placed at the end of your driveway, yard, or curbside. This is how you should place your carts on collection days. An information package will be left for you, further introducing you to the new program with information spanning from instructions on how to place your cart on different types of streets to options for cart upsizing, or details on what goes into each cart. Wow, you really know your stuff. Tell me, why are there three colors of carts? Well, this one is for organics, this one is for garbage, and this blue one over here is for any recyclables. Very good. Now, what goes into the blue recycling cart? Cardboard, plastic containers, milk jugs, cans, or anything that used to go into the yellow recycling bags. Now, David, what goes into the green cart? The green cart is for your organics. Any compostable food, pizza boxes, or napkins. Anything that used to go into the old organics bin. And? And what? I'll give you a hint. Yard clippings. Yes, the new green cart has plenty of room for grass and weeds. Now, what about the black cart? Easy. That one is for garbage. Any waste that can't be composted or recycled. But what if the carts aren't big enough? Well, the city of Nanaimo has an exchange program in place. Homes that have more demand for recycling and household waste can upsize their carts. That reminds me. Anyone that has questions about the Sort Toss Roll program can call the hotline or visit our webpage. The standard 240 litre blue recycling cart can hold three times the amount of recyclables as your yellow bag and it won't blow away in the wind. The 120 litre green cart can hold three times as much as your old green bin and the 120 litre black bin is about the size of one and a half garbage bags. And now you won't even need to buy those black garbage bags. Are you going to get that? I probably should. Take over for a bit, will you? Uh, okay. Excellent. Thanks. Hang on. Let's try this. Sort Toss Roll is a new way of doing away with waste. New trucks are a big part of the program and come equipped with an automated arm to lift, dump, and replace the carts on collection day. The trucks are efficient. Each truck has two compartments and can pick up both your weekly organics and your recycling or garbage. They are also fueled by compressed natural gas, so they are green too. And the trucks are safe. Our waste collectors no longer need to lift the cans manually. This means far less injuries on the job and happier workers. 
The new trucks are awesome. The arms can reach out up to 10 feet to pick up the carts. It is important you place them properly on collection day though to make sure that your waste and recycling can be picked up. How you place your carts depends largely on the type of street your home is on. If your street looks like this, with a sidewalk divided and set in from the curb, place your carts like this. If your street looks like this, with a sidewalk and a curb as one, place your carts like this. If your street doesn't have a sidewalk or curb, place your carts like this at the end of your driveway. And finally, if you have a curbed sidewalk but can't place your carts behind the sidewalk because of a wall, ditch, or fence, place your carts like this in front of the curb. Always remember to place your carts one meter apart to allow room for the automated arm, and point the arrow on your cart legs towards the street. In the occasional neighborhood, there are other factors that may affect how you can place your carts, such as street parking or steep hills. The city of Nanaimo will find a collection solution for every situation. It may not look like it, but there's technology in the carts. Each cart has a digital ID tag, which tells the truck which house it belongs to and whether it's the recycling, organics, or waste cart, so that it gets dumped to the right compartment at pickup. Contamination happens when things that can't get recycled get tossed into the blue cart. Styrofoam, plastic bags and glass can't be accepted at the curb. The automated sorting machine at the recycling facility cannot process them. This means contaminated loads of recycling end up being sent to landfill. So do your part and recycle smart. Sort, toss, roll. It's easy, efficient, green, clean and safe. I was going to say that. Go ahead then. It's easy, efficient, green, clean, and safe. That about sums it up. David, time for dinner. Don't worry, we've covered a lot today. And if people want to learn more about Sort, Toss, Roll, call the hotline, 250-756-5390. Come on, David. I've got to go. What was that number again? 250-756-5390.
permit Developments, develop and variance permit application number DVP 379 240 Twiggly Wiggly Road, only in Nanaimo. Mr. Lindsay. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. As you mentioned, this is development uh, variance permit application, in this case, specifically to vary the conditions of, or the requirements of the zoning bylaw in order to allow, allow a heat pump to be go, uh, moved from the rear of the home to the uh, to the side of the home as outlined in the report the nearest uh, residence to the proposed siting uh, the proposed location of the heat pump is greater than 25 meters and uh, the air photo that's uh, projected behind you identifies the, the subject property is there anyone here wishing to speak with respect to dvp 379 could someone make the recommended motion the recommendation. second Seconded uh, by Councillor Armstrong, moved by Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion on this? Councillor Turley. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Lindsay, um, I recall that we had a similar um, proposal that we passed um, off of um, uh, near, down in the Hammond Bay area. Um, and the question I have is, is the uh, unit visible from the street as it's on the side of the house? Because uh, that was the issue at the time of that one. So. In this case, the, the unit and the siding will be uh, visible from the street, but the applicants are proposing screening around around the unit. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Contrary? None opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. The next is liquor license application number LA135-11 Cliff Street. Mr. Lindsay again. Thank you, Your Worship. As outlined in the agenda, this report is uh, simply for information this evening. Uh, the, the application will be forwarded to uh, a public meeting, such as a public hearing, to pro uh, provide opportunity for individuals to provide comment to Council before Council will make its final de determination and recommendation on, on the liquor license application. Uh, in this case, it's uh, proposed for a lounge endorsement as part of a proposed uh, microbrewery on the subject property. Moved by Councillor Hemmins, seconded by Councillor Brown, Councillor Turley. Yes, Your Worship, I just have another question. Um, the, it says 11 Cliff Street, uh, and there are multiple businesses in there, and I understood there's different, <coughs> excuse me, unit numbers. <coughs> this is for the whole, sorry, <coughs> for the whole property, or is there a specific unit number? Your Worship, the, the lounge endorsement will be tied to the specific use. Uh, I don't have the unit numbers, but I believe it's in the in the unit that previously had the, um, uh, there was an animal uh, fish tank store in there at one time, but I believe that's there. Thanks. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Um, just one question. I know the proposed occupant load is 50. What about for the patio? Or is that irrelevant? Um, the patios, because they're seasonal and outside the building, they're not included in the, in the occupant loads. Thank you. No further discussion. All those in favor of the motion? Contrary? Unanimous. Thank you. A rezoning application number RA411-25 Front Street. Mr. Lindsay again, please. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, just in terms of background, I would note that staff at this point have received 15 uh, applications uh, for cannabis retail stores within the community. A number of those have already been introduced to Council and made their way through the public hearing process. Uh, there's four uh, new, new applications which are on their agenda this evening, and the first application is item L uh, for 25 Front Street, and this is rezoning for a site, again, site-specific rezoning to allow for cannabis retail store on the subject property. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay? Move the recommended motion. Councillor Hemmins, seconded Councillor Brown. Your Worship, sorry to interrupt, but it is a, a rezoning, um, so it needs to be read. So acting Mayor Bonner, possibly? Yes, for, that's right. In fairness, we should let Councillor Bonner read, absolutely. That's what, that's I, what I get paid the big bucks for. I know. Yeah. Motion that Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2019 number 4500.141 to rezone 25 Front Street to allow cannabis retail store as a site-specific use in the Chapel Front DT5 zone past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Contrary, motion carried. 
Councillor Bonner. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.141 pass second reading. Second. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion? One question where it says site specific use in the gateway DT5 zone, and then in the other, uh, in the motion, it's chapel front DT5 zone. Is there a difference? Sorry, Your Worship, the, uh, the correct term is uh, the chapel front uh, DT5 zone as uh, in the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Uh, sorry? sorry. Councillor Thorpe, sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to uh, Mr. Lindsay, just if you could, Mr. Lindsay, explain the, uh, the process from this point on for me. It involves public hearing and also there's referral to the provincial government. What, what steps happen first and in what order? Thank you, uh, Three Your Worship, Councillor Thorpe. So prior to staff bringing forward applications uh, for council's consideration, we received confirmation that the province has received an application uh, for a license. Uh, so as part of this process, uh, once the bylaw, if council deems uh, the bylaws, uh, or the applications uh, worthy of third reading, uh, after third reading, uh, they're referred back to the province. And basically at that point we wait uh, for their determination on the licensing and for a determination of whether the applicants are uh, what they what they refer to as fit and proper to hold a license. In that case, once we have confirmation from the province, uh, we would return to council uh, for consideration of final adoption of the zoning amendment bylaw. Thank you. Very good. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Contrary? Motion carried. Councillor Bonner. Motion that the Council direct staff to secure the amenity contribution at BC Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch approval prior to adoption of the bylaw. Should Council support the bylaw to third reading? Second. Seconded. Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion? All those in favour? Motion carried. Thank you. Rezoning application number RA413 3923 Victoria Avenue. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Worship. Uh, as mentioned, this is also a rezoning for a site-specific amendment to allow for a cannabis retail store on the subject property. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay? Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.138 to rezone 3923 Victoria Avenue to cannabis retail store as a site-specific use in the neighborhood center CC2 zone. Pass first reading. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Contrary. Motion carried. Motion that Zenin, zoning uh, amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.138 pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you to staff. Uh, oops, I need to, have to read this. <laughs> Can you describe, um, what is the difference between the RCMB comments of no concern and no comment? Because in some of them it says no concern and some of them says no comment. Is that, is there a difference there or? Um, I, I believe it's probably some liberties with the authors of the report who are, who are taking no response as, as no comment. So I, I would say they're, they're the same. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Contrary? None. See none. Motion carried. Thank you. The next is rezoning application number RA416. Yeah. Sorry, we have to do third reading. Sorry, sorry, pardon me. Third reading. I'm rushing you. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Second. Yes. Right. We have to. Motion that council direct staff to secure the amenity contribution and BC Liquor and Cannabis Regulation branch approval prior to adoption of the bylaw. Should council support the bylaw at third reading? Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Contrary. Motion carried. Now we can get to rezoning application number RA416-Unit A, 1483 Bowen Road. Again, Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Your Worship. This is also a site-specific amendment to allow for a cannabis retail store on the subject property at 1483 Bowen Road. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay? 
Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.139 to rezone 1483 Bone Road to allow cannabis retail store as a site specific use in the community corridor core three of a zone. Pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmins. All those in favor? Contrary, none. Motion carried. Councillor Bonner. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.139 pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmins. Any discussion? All those in favor? Contrary, seeing none. Motion carried. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. A motion that Council direct staff to secure the amenity contribution and BC Liquor and Cannabis Regulation branch approval prior to adoption of the bylaw should Council support the bylaw at third reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmins. All those in favour? None con contrary. Seeing none, motion carried. Thank you. Uh, the next is uh, rezoning application number RA417, unit 105, 510 Fifth Street. Mr. Lindsay. Uh, thank you, Worship. Again, a rezoning application to allow for cannabis retail store on the subject property at 510 Fifth Street. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay? I do. Councillor Hemmins. Thank you. Very quickly, do these rezonings um, apply if the storm moves and something else moves in? Like, does it stay on the property? So a cannabis store could go in after another cannabis store is vacated and not have to go through this process? And that's correct, Your Worship. In, in all cases, zoning refers to the use of land and not the user. So once the use uh, is allowed for on the property, um, the, the proponent could leave the site and a new, uh, a new proponent could, could use that land. Thank you. Uh, all those in f favor? Not your worship, sorry. sorry. Have we read it yet? No, we haven't. We're, we're just yet. rushing ahead. Councillor Bonner, sorry. Never, not till the next election. <laughs> 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 Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.140 to rezone 510 Fifth Street to allow cannabis retail store as a site specific use in the city commercial center CC3 zone. Pass first reading. Seconded again, Councillor Hemmins. All those in favor? Contrary, none. Motion carried. Mr. Bonner. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.140 pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmins. Any discussion? All those in favor? Contrary, none. Motion carried. Councillor Bonner. Motion that Council directs staff to secure the amenity contribution and BC Liquor and Cannabis Regulation branch approval prior to adoption of the bylaw. Should Council support the bylaw at third reading? Seconded, Councillor Hemmins. All those in favor? Contrary, seeing none, motion carried. These things are sprouting up all over. The next is rezoning application number RA4032397 Barclay Road. Mr. Lindsay again. Thank you, Worship. I'm going to introduce uh, items, the next two items, items P and Q as they are almost uh, identical applications and they are within the same neighborhood. In fact, these are applications are separated by, uh, separated by one property. Both applications are from the same applicant and they're both uh, requesting a rezoning of the property from R1 to R2 in order to allow for a two lot subdivision of each, of each parcel. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay? Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.136 to rezone 2397 Barclay Road from single dwelling residential R1 to single dwelling residential small lot R2 pass first reading. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Contrary, none. Motion carried. Councillor Bonner. Your Worship. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.136 pass second reading. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a 
couple of questions. Uh, I was wondering, uh, through you, Your Worship, to staff, can you describe the process where the community contribution is decided upon, uh, like how much it is going to be for and where does it go? To, to Your Worship, to Councillor Bonner, so in terms of how much uh, it's based on Council's uh, current policy, uh, which is $1,000 per door. So in this case, each, each of the applications are proposing a $2,000 contribution. In terms of where it goes to, uh, it's ultimately we work with the applicant to seek, um, to seek their recommendation, but it's often based on either uh, recommendations in the official community plan or in the neighborhood plan that speak to desired amenities uh, that, that the community may have. Good. Could I be indulged to read a little bit about the community contributions at this point? Ms. Gurry, is it appropriate for Councillor Bonner to raise his issue now? Um, can I just get some clarification, Your Worship, through you to Councillor Bonner? Um, I'm, I'm just wanted to bring up the, uh, the issue of how low these community contributions are and what they probably should be but I'd be willing to do this at another time. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lindsay. So, so Your Worship, what I can say is uh, in past councils, and I know this council's brought it up too, is this very topic. And reviewing our community contributions is on staff's work plan. It is one of the items we have scheduled to get to. And I do recognize that there is a, a review that's, that's required. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Contrary, seeing none, carried. And finally, motion that council direct staff to secure the community contribution and covenant for general building design prior to the adoption of the bylaw should council support the bylaw at third reading. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Contrary, none, motion carried. Rezoning application number RA414-2387 Barclay Road. Mr. Lindsay's more or less already introduced this. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay? Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.137 to rezone 2387 Barclay Road from single dwelling residential R1 to single dwelling residential small lot R2 past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Contrary, none. Motion carried. Councillor Bonner. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.137 pass second reading. Okay. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion? All those in favor? Contrary, none. Motion carried. Councillor Bonner. Motion that council direct staff to secure the community contribution and covenant for general building design prior to the adoption of the bylaw should council support the bylaw at third reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Contrary, none. Motion carried. Councillor Bonner, you can take the rest of the night off, so to speak. No, I'm not sure we can or not. No, <laughs> just, I don't just, think so. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Number 11? Okay. Motion that inter-community business license amendment bylaw 2019 number 7176.01 to expand the participants in the Inter-Municipal Business Licensing Program be adopted. Any discussion? This is a, Mr. Lindsay, I think we know what this is about. This is a very good program. I think this is good for business in Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Contrary, motion carried. We have no correspondence. Sorry, Mr. Lindsay. Yeah. Thank you, Worship. Just just before we leave the bylaw section, I just wanted to note that all of the rezoning applications that were on your agenda package this evening uh, will, that received first and second reading will now proceed to the public hearing, which is May the 2nd. May the 2nd. Thank you. So nothing on correspondence. Uh, item 13, notice of motion. Councillor Brown. Excuse me, Your Worship. There's right, an item uh, bylaw status sheet for information. I just had a question on it. Mr. Lindsay, yes, for Mr. Lindsay, I assume, because I can't give you an answer, or um, Ms. Gurry. I can probably help, maybe. <laughs> so it's uh, bylaw 4500.131, shows that it's passed first and second reading and is going to public hearing. I thought we already did that. Um, 
Your Worship, I can follow up with Councillor Turley. It could be that um, we hadn't updated it correctly in time for tonight's meeting, so I can check on that. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Turley. Now we'll get to Councillor Brown. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the notice of motion is on your agenda, and I've been informed by our city clerk that uh, I do not need to read it all out to you, as much as some of you are. Blessings anticipating, to the but uh, the hour is late, so I will not. Uh, but I just will say I will follow up with some relevant information for uh, council um, to be included with this, just for deliberation. Thank you very much. Fourteen other business design advisory committee appointments, Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Worship. This is just simply confirming uh, the recent appointments that council has made uh, to the design advisory panel. Thank you very much, including Councillor Brown as a representative for Marion Council. Question period, Ms. Gouray. Do we have any questions tonight? <coughs> Thanks very much. Matthew O'Donnell, 10H. Mr. Don. Hi there. I just have a couple of questions. Um, I'm very, uh, very interested about just the variance permit uh, and the variance application process. So I just had a couple of general questions. Uh, just um, how long does it take for a variance permit uh, to be processed from like the application of the, the homeowner, for argument's sake, all the way to when uh, city council would vote on it, yay or nay, on average? Mr. Lindsay, can you answer that? Your Worship, it depends somewhat on the nature of the variance, but I would, I would estimate somewhere between uh, six and 12 weeks. Six and 12 weeks for a variance development permit? For just like, just generally speaking, like? Yes. Anywhere? Weeks? Oh, okay. Um, how, long, uh, how long did this particular variance permit take uh, to complete from start to finish? Sorry, Worship, I, I, don't have, I don't have the application date in front of me, but I would say it's consistent with the other uh, variance applications that we have uh, for similar items. Can I ask a follow-up? Uh, do you think it was like just from your own recollection or from your own recollection, uh, was it uh, like weeks or months, do you think? It, it would be measured in weeks, but I, I don't know the number, Your Worship, I could follow up. Um, is there an application fee, like when you apply for a variance uh, permit, just generally speaking, uh, is there any sort of like application fee or anything like that? Mr. Lindsay? Uh, yes, and if the follow-up question is, did the city pay one, the answer is yes. For how much? I'm, I'm hard hearing, I apologize. How much? Uh, I believe, I'd have to check, but I believe there's $750. So only $750? Oh, okay. Um, uh, has there been any instances uh, where, for at least hypothetically speaking in the history of the city to anyone's recollection or staff's recollection, has there been any instances where like an application fee was like waived or any exceptions were made or is it just like by the book, black and white? Oh, um, your Worship, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of council waiving uh, an application fee. I could stand to be correct. I just can't think of one right now. Councilor Armstrong might have an answer. I will say that in terminal, we didn't get any say. Special legislation for that, so that had nothing to do with the city. So, if you're asking that question, that never came to council for variance. Oh, with the modular housing. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, the province just. Put that's it on. A province enacted legislation, so that's why that didn't come before council. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a follow up question, just in general, though, not specifically maybe about the modular housing, but just any in general, the it could be uh, you wouldn't be able like the province doing that. That was kind of like an extreme circumstance. Like it wouldn't. Correct. Be, okay. Thank you very much. Um, and also, has there, are there any like mechanisms in place within our city for variance applications where they could be maybe expedited under hypothetical extreme circumstances? Or would all variance applications need to go through the same cut and dry black and white process regardless of circumstance, hypothetically speaking? I'm going to ask Mr. Lindsay to answer that, but with great respect, these questions are more properly directed to staff, not to, to absorb I'm asking the time you, I council meeting. I, just, I, I, I try to save as much time as possible, and I know you guys don't have the answers. I'll answer so. that. 
so Mr. Lindsay doesn't have to. Um, sometimes when, we, and I can speak and maybe uh, Councillor Thorpe can echo it, if, if we have um, like the subsidized housing that went in for seniors, we may ask for that to be expedited, expedited as a council. Now, whether that happens or not, that depends on their workload. I mean, I think from my perspective, everything that the staff has done is very fair. They proceed in the order that it comes. And, and I've never seen a deviation myself. I don't know if Councillor Thorpe has, but all I know is I believe they do the best they can with the resources that they have, and they're very fair. Absolutely. Okay, well, th thanks a lot, and uh, have a great night. Thank you. Motion for adjournment. Yes, I will move. Moved by Councillor Turley. I see him first. Councillor Hammond second. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much, everyone.